Hello there, fellow zombie slayers! My name is Stanley557. Cold War Zombies, a return to form for Treyarch after the bombastic and expensive endeavor known as Black Ops 4 Zombies. A bombshell of money and ambition thrown at a project that had everything that could have gone wrong, well, gone wrong. Following the failures of Black Ops 4, the team at Treyarch decided to return to the drawing board and reduce what caused the game to fail and expand upon what worked. But there's a catch. Because there always is one. Treyarch was forced to develop this next entry a year ahead of schedule, taking the reins from Sledgehammer after Activision was reportedly unsatisfied with the development the team was making on their version of the project. With the clock against them, Treyarch was forced to reevaluate their ambitions with the game mode. Black Ops 4 was riddled with issues, one of them being overambition. So will this restraint force the team to trim the loftier ideas and capture the same magic that cultivated World at War in Black Ops 1? Or will the team stumble at the starting line and fail to regain their composure, much like Black Ops 4? Well, I'm glad you've all decided to stick with me on this adventure, as we continue to review every single Call of Duty Zombies game. So let's answer these questions, and more, in my complete review of Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War Zombies. The good, the bad, and the crunch. Welcome back, Strike Team. Let's go get them. Before jumping into the game, let's do what we always do on this channel and go over what Cold War does to set itself apart from other zombie outings. There are a lot of changes made to the formula, so let's begin. Let's start with the changes to the perk system. For the first time since Advanced Warfare, Treyarch finally removed the perk limit imposed on players since World at War. Now, at any point during the game, players will be able to collect and purchase perk cans with an all-new pricing system. Each perk now costs a standardized amount when no perks are equipped this being 2,500 points. As players purchase perks, this price increases by an additional 500 points per perk, regardless of the order they are purchased in. So now something like Mule Kick is valued at what you consider the perk's value to be, rather than the base price of 4,000 points. If players plan to purchase all 10 of Cold War's perks, the price skyrockets to 7,000 points for the player's 10th additional perk, which is insane, but it's completely superfluous as players don't exactly need all 10 perks at all times and it's more of a bonus for all performing players in the later rounds. There's also the changes to the point system. While first introduced in Black Ops 4, Cold War Zombies will always offer players a minimum of 90 points per kill, no longer rewarding points based on bullets hit like in previous entries, or percentage of damage done like in Black Ops 4. If you participate in a kill, you earn the points, regardless of how much damage you participated in actually doing, with headshots and melee kills now offering the same added bonus of 25 additional points making the new point maximum per zombie 115, which I just adore. There's also the new damage calculation formula too. In every previous entry, zombies dealt a total of 50 damage to the player, always downing them in two hits in World of War to Black Ops 2, three in Advanced Warfare, IW, World War 2, and BO3, and four in Black Ops 4, without any additional modifiers or jug. In Cold War, the formula was changed, now each enemy deals 30 damage to the player for the first 10 rounds, allowing them to take 5 hits before downing. Once round 11 rolls over, players will now take 50 damage, downing them in 3. Following round 31, zombies will now deal 75 damage, downing them in 2. And finally, on round 51 and onward, enemies will begin to super sprint like Black Ops 4 zombies in high rounds, and deal 90 damage per hit, downing players in just 2 hits. I love this system. It prevents a lot of the early game downs like the team had wanted in Black Ops 4, but ramps up the difficulty during the game, and allows players to slowly kit themselves out with weaponry, perks, and map setup. Unlike Black Ops 4, which puts power into the player's hands as soon as the game begins, with 4 hits and a specialist weapon. A lot of players were frustrated that Black Ops 4 starts them out too powerful, and doesn't allow them to grow with the game, and I believe this system meets a nice compromise. One of the biggest bonuses this change brings is an added level of protection for newer players, giving them a chance to get off their feet in the early rounds, making the early game less punishing for beginners to the series, something the development team has been trying to do since Black Ops 4. But even with a maxed out can of jug, you'll still down in 3 hits past round 51, so what's a high round player to do? Well, that's where the armor system comes into play. Following the issues introduced with the armor system in Black Ops 4, the developers went back to the drawing board and reworked the system entirely, making it more of their own. This time closely resembling how it actually works in Warzone. Instead of taking two direct hits like in Black Ops 4 while using specific temporary mechanics like specialist weapons or Snowfall Stronghold, 
The developers decided that armor would not only replace the shield mechanic, but would also be another addition to the player's defensive arsenal. Purchasing armor in Cold War will allow players to take hits from all sides, with reduced damage with each tier of armor increasing the amount of hits players can take. I'm conflicted with the armor system. While I admire its inclusion, it's both an improvement and a downgrade from the shield mechanic. Sure, it takes hits from all sides, but will always deplete no matter what. Players will always have their armor drained, whereas with the shield, the player can tactfully maneuver their character to take hits with the shield or allow their health bar to take the hit, allowing the shield to remain unharmed. It's a very nuanced mechanic for more experienced players. To play Devil's Advocate though, armor is a very simple system to understand and obtain, unlike the fetch quest-like system of gameplay with the shield. And because of the salvage mechanic, losing and purchasing new armor isn't as punishing as the Geist Child system from World War II. Speaking of salvage, let's talk about the scavenge mechanic and the subsequent scavenge currency. Salvage. In every other zombies entry, players start with multiple lethal equipment, typically grenades. To obtain various tacticals and other lethal equipments, players must roll the mystery box, complete quest lines, or simply purchase them off the wall. Cold War completely reworks the entire mechanic by removing these diverse options and simply having the undead drop these items, much like IW's backpack mechanic. But unlike IW, the rate at which these items drop is extremely generous, and oftentimes a little overbearing. Like, look at all this garbage littering the ground on Forsaken. The undead have the ability to drop anything from the standard grenade to the destructive LT-53 Kazmir. And in some rare cases, even a ray gun on Outbreak. I would prefer something more powerful. Yeah, that's kinda cool. This system allows players to scavenge the undead for various means of destruction, and all of them have been overtuned to always insta-kill the standard enemy at any round, regardless of health, as long as the equipment lands a direct hit. So there's no BO4 situation where Wraith Fires were clearly the best of the chosen lethal equipment. Is this broken? Yes. Why does no one bring it up? I don't really know, but it makes the game more fun. You've got frag grenades, semtexes, Molotovs, C4, and Tomahawks on the lethal side. Then there's stim shots, stun grenades, decoys, monkey bombs, and Kazmir devices on the tactical side. Each of these various pieces of equipment has their own usage, and the player is given a ton of freedom with how they obtain and use them. Don't prefer the cooking time of the frag grenades? Then Semtexes might be more up your alley. Want a piece of equipment with a lingering ability to reduce the undead to ashes? Then the Molotovs are perfect. Need some space between you and the undead to revive a teammate? Then craft a monkey bomb, decoy, or Kazmir device. Cold War offers the players the largest variety of destruction. Alongside equipment, there's also salvage, which comes in two varieties, Mountain Dew and Pepsi. Green salvage comes in batches of 50, and is used to purchase lower tier armor, weapon rarity upgrades, rerolling weapon attachments, and purchasing additional lethal and tactical equipment. Blue salvage comes in batches of 10, and is used to purchase the highest armor tier, higher weapon rarity upgrades, and score streaks. All these purchases are made at two of the game's newest crafting tables, the aptly named Crafting Table and the Ivan Machine, otherwise known as the Armory. At the Crafting Table, players can create lethal and tactical equipment without needing to scavenge from zombies and create score streaks. Much like their inclusion in multiplayer, score streaks are a destructive form of killing that instead of being awarded to skilled players, can be crafted and used at any time to enhance the zombie killing experience like specialist weapons. Unlike Black Ops 4 specialist mechanic though, players don't start off with a destructive wonder weapon and have to purchase them or earn them from the mystery box. So now score streaks like Cruise Missile and Chopper Gunner make their first appearance in zombies. At launch, I was extremely worried these systems weren't going to fit into the game mode at all. But after about a year or so of playing around with them, their inclusion isn't as jarring. Although I preferred the previous specialist weapons as they had more personality to them. It's not like you fire down a 115 infused cruise missile or anything. You just call in an airstrike. Wow, so cool. It's a shame. These devices were hardly given any personality besides the RC car's Ethereum battery. The score streaks are as follows. Crossbow, hand cannon, death machine, flamethrower, War Machine, Sentry Turret, Artillery Strike, Cruise Missile, RC Car, and Chopper Gunner. And at the Armory, players are able to purchase and repair their armor, and upgrade their weapon's rarity. Another change is the player's starting weapon. Unlike every other Zombies entry, players are able to start with any weapon of their choosing. 
To balance this feature, there's the weapon rarity system, akin to Fortnite. Weapons come in various different tiers and colors that determine their damage output and efficiency. Players spawn in with a red tier weapon, the weakest of the bunch. Players can then decide to purchase a higher tier weapon, or upgrade their current weaponry to increase their damage. And as rounds progress, various wall buys and the mystery box will upgrade their output, producing higher tier weapons to allow players to change their loadout whenever they please mid-game. All these systems create an extremely nuanced roguelike game design that's never been seen before in Zombies. But because of their player's ability to upgrade their chosen weaponry at the armory and the consistent output of the scavenger system, players aren't forced to play very roguelike if they don't desire to, and can play each match virtually the same. So your Junior Rizzos can change up the gameplay on a dime, and your Stanley 557s can play each match the exact same. This flexibility was a smart move on the development team's part. It's quite clear they learned from the inconsistent mistakes and mishaps taken during Black Ops 4's development. Alongside these changes, there's also changes made to the Pack-a-Punch. Taking a page out of Advanced Warfare and a W, Cold War introduces differing Pack-a-Punch levels, with one tier being a basic Pack-a-Punch, tier 2 being an increased damage for 15,000 points, and tier 3 increasing damage even more for an additional 30,000 points. This allows players to continue to spend their points late into the game and provides them with an increased damage to keep up with the ever-increasing zombie health. Unlike AW, however, players are able to seamlessly upgrade their weapons in as little as a few seconds, with one click of a button, compared to the slow and arbitrary 25 weapon system upgrade. And players can also choose their alternate ammo type ability without spending the Pack-a-Punch machine for the one they want. Thank you, Treyarch, for finally having a brain! In tandem with the weapon rarity system, players are able to make more or less any weapon decently effective late into the high rounds. And with the health cap, most weapons are able to at least kill at any round, which is something that can't be said for most standard weaponry in any of these games. But in the words of the one and only Craig Houston, Every gun has a path to become an uber weapon. Continuing on with the gameplay, there's also the challenge system. First introduced in Ancient Evil, players can offer their points to a trial machine to initiate a randomized challenge. Participating in these challenges will allow players to grow their reward. The more they participate, the higher their reward, with the best tier offering players pack-a-punch weapons, perks, and even the map's respective wonder weapon. Sadly, because of the game's roguelike design, it's impossible to guarantee you'll get what you want. So have fun getting a sledgehammer over and over again trying to get the wonder weapon. I personally don't like this system, but that's because it doesn't suit my gameplay style. Two notes though, I hate how each challenge is only 90 seconds. That's way too short, unlike Ancient Evil's two minute challenges. And for some reason in Black Ops 4, the purple tier was considered legendary and the orange tier was considered epic. But in Cold War it's flipped around with the purple tier being considered epic and the legendary tier is orange. Why make that random change? Then there's arguably the game's most important change, which is the player's movement. While we can't infinitely change sides like in Black Ops 3, players are now able to mantle over any railing and climb on map terrain, within reason. FINALLY! This is easily the best change the game makes and massively improves map flow and movement progression. You can see them testing the waters with this idea in Togger Toten, but it's so good to see this mechanic finally explored even if it completely destroys the game's AI at times. Another added mechanic is the exfil system. Once players reach round 11, and every 5 rounds afterwards, players will be able to initiate an exfil if they so desire. Doing so will allow players to end the game on their own terms, and if they succeed in escaping, they'll be rewarded with additional XP and Ethereum crystals, which can be used to upgrade the player. To successfully exfil, players have to arrive at the exfil point, and in a short amount of time, Clear the field of any undead who wish to halt their escape attempt. Honestly, I don't enjoy the exfil mechanic. The onslaught of enemies starts out as hectic and chaotic, but after 30 seconds you'll have wiped out most of the horde, leaving the energy of the event feeling lopsided. This system just doesn't work because as the threat is eliminated, the tension goes down, it loses players interest. And that's not really the best call in the game's final moments. World War II has a similar issue with its exfil mechanic in the tortured path. Players aren't required to kill enemies, so they can just train near the exfil point and escape when the time calls for it. Cold War has the exact opposite problem, but a similar issue of losing difficulty. 
My ideal X-Fall situation would simply involve having an infinite number of the undead spawned in, with bosses galore overrunning the player, forcing them to fight them, or die trying training them. But that's just me. And of course, for the story and plot progression, there's the intel system. As players traverse the map, they'll find intel that explains to them various bits and pieces of the story. As players collect said intel, it'll become viewable in the main menu, allowing players to review dialogue and radios whenever they please, much like World War II's intel system. Bits of intel can also be found in the form of these little models, which I love. It's so cool getting to see the team's arduous work in such an isolated environment. Now, collecting this intel is another problem and can be quite tedious work, especially if you didn't keep up at all during the game's life cycle. Like in the game's open world mode, Outbreak, there's over 500 individual pieces of intel. Yeah, have fun collecting all that at this point. I adore the intel system though, and throughout the year, it kept me actively engaged in the game's story, even if a lot of it was the game telling its story rather than showing us. A lot of players complained the system was terrible, but the only issue that I see with the intel system was that it was the only way the game was actually telling its story in the opening months of the game. We've always had radios and ciphers in every single game previous. The only difference in Cold War was we didn't have a dedicated team to play as that interacted with the map around us. And this leads into a discussion about the changes made to our playable characters, otherwise known as the operator system. Something Activision has been pushing for for a very long time. Until recently, Zombies has remained relatively microtransaction free. You could always earn Black Ops 3's Liquid Diviniums, Black Ops 4's Numulian Plasma, IW's Keys, and World War II's Supply Drops, with each of these systems offering their respective gobblegums, elixirs, fortune cards, and consumables. While these systems helped, they weren't required. Heck, I play Black Ops 4 with only classic elixirs all the time, and I believe the game plays perfectly with them. But each game's consumables changed the gameplay, but not the overall style, interaction, and storytelling each map told through its characters. But without those systems and zombies, Activision finally made the decision to force the operator system on the team, completely replacing the need for a cannon crew. Which is weird, like why not just have a cannon crew plus operators? So now characters like Modern Warfare's Price, Scream's Ghostface, and John McClane make their appearance in Zombies as a part of the US government's Requiem Strike Team, a special forces group made up of nondescript characters that fulfill set missions by the game's named characters, Mackenzie Carver, Elizabeth Gray, Oscar Strauss, and Campaign's own Gregory Weaver. Players choose from any of the marketable operators and their chosen skin, and no matter who you play as, the Requiem leaders will provide much of the commentary over the map, completely changing how players interact with the world around them. I mean, heck, you get to play as Samantha Maxis as an operator skin, but she's just about as generic as the other multiplayer operators around her. Operators simply respond in extremely generic ways while demolishing the undead, with a lot of the game's colorful commentary left for the Requiem leaders during a map's main quest, completely draining a lot of the life that Cruz brought to the table. Regardless of their writing quality, I'd much rather take characters like AW's Khan, World War II's Jefferson, IW Sally, and BO4's Bruno any day over the operator system. But beggars can't be choosers, I suppose. For some reason, the team never included a cannon crew, unlike World War II Zombies, which has both a cannon crew and additional nondescript characters who provide very generic quotes. So with Cold War, we're left with only the nondescript characters. None of them interact with any of their map surroundings because operators have to be curated to fit all of the maps at all times only interacting with the player when killing the undead, a universal constant. Failure can haunt you. Believe me. Say my name. I dare you. You underestimate me. You always have. Is that really all you have? Death is all you deserve. Enemy appears KIA. Body dropped. This is wrong. Again, World War II did this system much better, and even giving us cannon operators would have gone a long way. But I guess it wouldn't have been enough for Activision, I presume. And hopping back to the gameplay, we have the wand system, this game's replacement for a specialist mechanic. Much like World War II's specialist abilities, the field upgrades, as they're called, are an ability that changes the way the player interacts with the horde, rather than an infinite damage wonder weapon. These abilities include Frost Blast, which freezes a horde of zombies with an icy touch, 
instantly shattering nearby enemies and slowing further ones, Energy Mine, which blows away any horde within its deadly range, Aether Shroud, which is basically in plain sight with a movement bonus, Ring of Fire, the good one, this increases players' damage and allows them to hold down any point quite effectively, Healing Aura, which revives allies, prompts health regeneration, and blows back nearby zombies, Frenzy Guard, which slows the basic enemy to a crawl, refills your armor, and instantly kills any enemy unwise enough to touch you, Toxic Growth, which can aid players in holding down choke points and slowing the undead masses, and finally Tesla Storm, which increases the player's movement speed and stuns any nearby enemy. Enemy stunned will also take increased damage. Each of these abilities fulfills their own role, but many of them are overshadowed by the sheer utility of Aether Shroud and the output produced by Ring of Fire. Why kill one horde with an activation of Energy Mine when you can kill easily more than a horde and melt special enemies with ease with Ring of Fire? Why slow down zombies with Frenzy Guard when you can go invisible with Aether Shroud and simply purchase more armor? Why freeze a horde of zombies when you can simply use Ring of Fire to take out the horde and more in seconds? I'm not saying the other abilities don't have their uses, like Frenzy Guard being able to refill your armor and a pinch when you can't get armor. But Ring of Fire and Aether Shroud just have so much more application compared to the other ones outside of niche scenarios. Like, Healing Aura can instantly revive my teammates, but if I have Aether Shroud, I can not only protect myself when going to revive my teammates, but also use it on myself when in a sticky situation. But again, that's just me. The system's not terrible by any means, but it's quite clear which abilities emerged as the dominant ones, you know? Alongside many of the game's mechanics like perks and field upgrades, there's the upgrade system. Something completely new to Call of Duty Zombies, a player progresses through the rounds and exfil, they'll be able to earn Ethereum Crystals. These come in three different tiers depending on how far you get. These crystals are a currency that can be used to permanently upgrade many of the player's abilities and equipment. For example, Stamina Up starts out much like many of its previous incarnations, but when you upgrade it with crystals, it'll also then gain the ability to completely negate fall damage. Mule Kick, when upgraded, gains this BO4 modifier effect allowing players to receive their third weapon back upon purchasing the perk should they lose it upon downing. Some perks even come with new abilities. Deadshot, when fully upgraded, will provide players with damage bonuses if they continue to attack the same enemy consecutively. Players can upgrade their perks, field upgrades, pack a bunch abilities, and weaponry, with one upgrade even allowing players start the match with a bowie knife that one-shots until round 11. All of these upgrades allow experienced players to work towards kitting themselves out and when fully upgraded, you're rewarded quite handsomely for your dedication. Perks are more effective, field upgrades have more abilities, alternate ammo types deal more damage with increased effects, and your weapons are just simply more powerful. This system finally gives players a reason to come back to zombies. And finally, there's the Rampage Inducer, a unique gameplay mechanic on every Cold War round-based map that affects the gameplay of the map should players decide to turn it on, like double feature mode on AW's Descent. Activating the machine does two things. It allows zombies to run at their max speed as if it was round 51, and shortens the round change timer significantly, always keeping players in the middle of the battle, with little breathing room. The Rampage Inducer does not increase enemy damage or force spawn boss zombies like the Megaton. The Rampage Inducer is simply there to speed up the game, and players are given the choice to turn off the machine whenever they'd like. If you feel that Cold War is too easy, then the Rampage Inducer is the perfect device for you. It easily keeps you on your toes and will truly enhance your experience if you're looking for that extra kick. Hi, this is Editor Stanley, and while recording the video, I kind of realized a core feature of Cold War that I completely forgot to mention was the ammo box system. Ammo boxes make an appearance in every single round based zombies map. Ammo boxes are able to refill the player's ammo for a small price, with that price increasing depending on how high the pack punch level of the weapon that the players are trying to get ammo for is. Despite being very useful and completely destroying the zombies' management mechanic, the game mode doesn't really see their use past D-Machina and Firebase Z because of the increased special enemy rate in maps like Firebase Z, Mauder Toten, and Forsaken, and because of the perk Mule Kick, which allows regular zombies to drop ammo caches, almost completely refilling a player's ammo in just two or three zombies. Sadly, it's a really good mechanic for casual players, but is so rarely used post D-Machina in the game's launch. And nowadays, if you have Mule Kick, there's no reason to have it. But what do I know? All right, back to the video. And with all that said, I think we've covered every single change Cold War Zombies makes to the Zombies formula. As back to basics as the game is, 
it introduces a lot of changes to the main gameplay loop that drastically change the overall experience. But unlike Black Ops 4, a lot of these changes were implemented with a familiar coat of paint and a very thorough analysis of how they changed the game. So this made the transition process a lot easier for players, unlike the jarring decisions made in Black Ops 4. So with all these changes discussed, let's see how the game handles them all in Cold War Zombies' first map, D-Machina. This is where it started, Strike Team. Let's get some answers. And thus we've arrived at D Machina, the first map in our Cold War Zombies experience. With all the changes made to the gameplay, D Machina returns players to the familiar Nocturne Untoden, this time a rundown Nazi facility in Poland rather than just an abandoned bunker in Germany occupied Europe. D Machina introduces players to the all new Dark Ether storyline, a fast new world filled to the brim with lore and backstory that explains what's going on and why it's happening again. So, what's the story? Following the events of Togner Toten, Nikolai Belinsky used the Agarthan device to create one perfect universe, a universe very similar to our own to be exact, one freed from the strife of 115 and the undead. Samantha Maxis and a young Edward Richthofen were sent to that universe to live the lives they should have lived all those years ago, with 115, the Keepers, the Ray Gun, Juggernaug, Pack-a-Punch, and so on, all abandoned to a realm below creation, the Dark Aether. The universe's trash can, essentially. Left to fester on its own, the realm developed its own ecosystem and hierarchy, a doomed reality filled to the brim with tyrannical gods and horrors beyond the comprehension of mankind, but one that was kept separate from the perfect world Nikolai sacrificed himself for. The Earth remained oblivious to the presence of the Dark Aether, until the 1940s. During World War II, Nazi scientists at Project End Station accidentally breached the veil between their realm and the Dark Aether, as they were researching the creation of nuclear weapons with the use of a cyclotron particle accelerator. Unable to be closed, the machine continued to run while spewing out energy that infected and reanimated those who remained too close to it. Over the coming months, the team changed directions from nuclear research to harnessing the powers of this mysterious energy, later to be known as Ethereum. As World War II neared its final days, Russian soldiers, storming the countryside, happened upon the facility and made plans to cover up the mess created and shut down the machine. A Russian soldier was quickly sealed inside and found a method to shut down the device for good, sealing off the Dark Aether from our reality. Which is until the 1980s. Under the direction of Russia's covert operations unit, Omega, Lev Kravchenko from Campaign leads a team of Russian forces to harness the power and weaponize Cyclotron phenomenons for the USSR during the Cold War. Basically, the powers of telepathy and ESP. While researching this fool's errand, the team accidentally stumbled upon hidden evidence of Project End Station, sealed away for nearly half a decade. Soon arriving back at the facility, the group reactivates the cyclotron, thus re-breaching the Dark Aether. This causes Dark Aether tears to appear all around the world, and forces the US government to form their own covert operation team, Requiem. We actually see some of these events play out in the game's onslaught mode. Under the direction of Grigori Weaver, the team would learn from Samantha Maxis, now all grown up, the existence of Project End Station, the origin of all these terrors happening around the world, and would soon form a team to shut down the facility, preventing more breaches from occurring worldwide. Much of this lore isn't exactly presented in the game, as a lot of pieces have been collected and compiled throughout the year. But I really enjoy the Dark Aether storyline, it's quite thorough with its explanations, and each and every character is explored, giving the world of the Dark Aether more light than meets the eye. Sadly, a lot of this lore in D Machina is hidden behind radios and intel over the span of multiple maps, with none of it really being expressed that well in-game. And seriously, who wants homework to go alongside their game? Moving on from the map story, let's talk about the map's design and overall aesthetic. Unlike the bombastic Nine or the lively Shadows of Evil, D Machina starts out with a very calm and subdued energy. The team did an excellent job to make the space feel actually unassuming even if it's as simple as covering the map in trees and snow in the middle of the Polish mountains. But compare the energy of the map when you spawn in to the energy of the map at the end of the main quest. And you. I love it when maps do this. It reminds me of how the Final Reich starts out in a very similar manner, with the slumbering town of Middleburg being the staging grounds for an undead onslaught. 
the town's quiet beginnings, soon overshadowed by zeppelins, giant monsters, Tesla guns, and the mythology that surrounds Geistcraft and the Sword of Barbarossa. This disposition is one of my favorite things about Dean Machina's atmosphere. Moving on, I'd be remiss to talk about the map's overall design and aesthetic if I didn't talk about the dark ether portion of the map. By interacting with any of the map's various ethereal tears during the easter egg, players will be able to enter the dark ether and get a glimpse of its beauty and horror. In a version of reality not too dissimilar from their own, the dark ether is a beautiful hellscape. While inside, players are able to break ethereum crystals to scavenge resources, perform various side easter eggs, interact with the other side, pushing forward the map's main quest, and showing the audience more of the story of what actually happened here, almost as if there's a guiding force helping our team. One of my biggest gripes with this amazing looking world is that we never actually get to revisit it during any of the other maps besides a single objective in Outbreak and some other pseudo Dark Aether zones in later maps. It's a real shame too, I know everyone was begging for Treyarch to allow us to return to this extremely unique locale. But alas, just something only in Dean Machina. Then there's the map's environmental storytelling. The area tells a mysterious story and keeps players wanting more. Before the outbreak, the facility was covered up and abandoned. Corpses that align the walls tell us something horrific happened here, and much like the charm of old zombies, makes players wonder about the events that went on here before we arrived. Sure, we see the aftermath of the first breach in the map's intro cutscene, but the team at Treyarch allows the mystery to take center stage as players progress through the map leaving answers ambiguous and allowing players to draw their own conclusions and make up their own ideas. Now, compare the environmental storytelling to a map like Voyage of Despair, which presents all of its storytelling through the contemporary set piece known as the Titanic. Voyage can feel unremarkable because the play space hardly uses the events of the Titanic to elevate its story, instead uses it as a set piece to play on. There isn't any pre-established history to explore besides the loosely expressed world of chaos as the Titanic is a contemporary set piece that uses the real world tragedy as a comedic punchline to the undead outbreak brought on by the Order. Like, you thought the iceberg is the least of their problems, just wait until the zombies get involved! Dean Machina's classic approach to storytelling is simple, but effective. Players aren't thrown a ton of lore their way, and the lore they're given is palatable enough to digest while they get used to the new mechanics the game has to offer. It's why Dean Machina is one of the best launch maps we've theoretically had. It's not as bombastic as Shadows of Evil or Nine, not as ambitious as Transit or Blood of the Dead, but not as simple as Keener or Toten. It has just the right blend of factors to suit any kind of player, old and new. Then there's the gameplay. For its first map, Cold War takes full advantage of the changes made to the game's movement system, especially in Nocturne and Toten and the Particle Accelerator Room. No longer are players restricted by railings and slightly differing heights of elevation. Instead, Dean Machina embraces this change and allows players to basically explore whatever they want, wherever they want. Many of the rooms in the bunker are designed with this level of play in mind. There's natural flow to the map's level design as players progress through Spawn, Knocked, the courtyard preceding the bunker, and the bunker itself, the map expands its movement options along the way. For example, in any other zombies entry, the team would be hard pressed to prevent players from climbing atop the particle accelerator, but in Cold War, you're like a five year old swinging around the monkey bars. The map design is quite open and encourages maneuverability and flexibility. Organic is the word I use to describe this level of design, and the developers allow players to explore it all for themselves. No hold X to mantle prompt or any tutorial of sorts, just smart direction. Once players learn about this mantle mechanic, the map design allows them to constantly experiment and test out new movement capabilities. Speaking of simplistic, let's talk about the map setup process. For the first time in Zombies, besides the Final Reich, players are given a campaign style walkthrough of the map. Despite the map design already leading players in the right direction, the team at Treyarch included campaign like markers that lead players to power and the subsequent pack a punch process. I actually really like this change. Something as simple as Pack-a-Punch shouldn't realistically be this Herculean ordeal like it is in maps like Gorai Krovi or the Shadow Throne. For casual players, obtaining Pack-a-Punch on Dean Machina is as easy as turning on the power, stabilizing the accelerator, activating the portal, grabbing a single part indicated to players by an objective marker, and in as quick as 5-10 to 10 minutes, players are able to open up the whole map and have the tools necessary to fight to their heart's content. This is a rather smart move on Treyarch's part. As much as a more complicated map might keep players engaged in the long run, 
D Machina keeps objectives simple. It doesn't require a guide of some kind like Shadows of Evil. It's why I believe the map has amazing longevity for the casual player. And it's clear to see with how popular D Machina was at Cold War's launch. Despite what many fans may think, being approachable is a great move for the series. Zombies shouldn't be this gate-kept game mode adored by hardcore fans. Allowing new players to get familiar with the series is why it got so popular in the first place. But by trying to appease a tightly knit community, you end up alienating those who would like to give it a try the most. Moving on from the setup, let's talk about some of our new adversaries. First and foremost, there's the third iteration of the Hellhound, with the Plaguehound, a radioactive dog-like enemy that lunges towards players like Nine's Tigers and when defeated, leaves behind a cloud of Nova 6 gas that damages players over time. I think I speak forever when I say that these enemies are just awful. They aren't difficult to defeat, they're just annoying. Alongside the play count, there's also the Megaton, apparently a mutated version of the Russian soldiers Omega sent to reactivate the Cyclotron. The Megaton is a monstrous threat who demands order on the battlefield. The beast has the ability to shoot long-range projectiles and produce a radioactive orb that damages players if they stand within its lethal range. Once defeated, the Megaton splits apart into two additional enemies, the Megaton Blaster and the Megaton Bomber, with each of these enemies using one of the respective attacks stated earlier, while also being harder targets to hit because of their smaller hitbox. I like the Megaton a lot. He imposes a good increase of difficulty when he arrives, but if you have Ring of Fire, the poor thing gets decimated. Although, I do hate a long taste for him to split when he receives enough damage. But, this phase change does prevent the enemy from getting decimated like Panzer Soldats or Blightfathers. <laughs> and of course, there's the map's wonder weapon the decompressive isotopic estrangement machine, otherwise known as the die. Oh, of course, leave it to the Nazis to create a weapon that literally spells out die. Do you think they even knew they were the baddies? The die shockwave is an extremely powerful rewrite of Black Ops 2's jet gun. Just like the aforementioned weapon, the die has the ability to consume the undead with an extremely powerful engine. But unlike the jet gun, it doesn't suck. <laughs> and the energy consumed can be discharged in a form of an energy blast, or a shockwave if you must. The die is a massive improvement over the jet gun, and I love its design. This hodgepodge of bits and bobs works really well for an Aether map, but keeps with a consistent sci-fi inspired design, compared to the literal pieces of trash that are shoved together to create the jet gun model. This wonder weapon is quite effective in combat, and when pack-a-punched, it fits the name Wonder Weapon quite well. Also, fun fact, the die's suck ability can be used to consume the toxic orbs unleashed by the Megaton. You know. The weapon also comes with elemental variants as well. Just like maps like Origins, Dreisendrock, and Ancient Evil before it, the die features four unique variants that can be easily completed and used. Starting off with the gas variant, there's the Die Nova 5. By simply killing a Plague Hound next to this machine in the bunker and filling an appropriate canister with gas, players are able to obtain the weapon. Unlike its sister Nova 6, Nova 5 is not deadly to humans, and the weapon discharges large gaseous clouds that quickly decimate the undead. And in high rounds, it just doesn't do that. This one was projected to be the most powerful of the bunch, but because the weapon doesn't take away a percentage of health per hit like Wonder Weapons like the Paralyzer, it fails to scale with enemy health in the higher rounds, becoming not as effective as you'd hope it'd be. Next up is the Ice Variant. All the player has to do is knock over this box in the knocked building, fill the flask with the liquid of this radioactive mushroom when infected by the radiation of a Megaton attack, and then once the solution has been formed, you can melt these chains inside of the speed cola room and build the die cryo emitter. Producing long beams of ice, the weapon freezes any undead in its path. And by many and any undead, I mean just one undead at the time. The weapon offers hardly any pierce capabilities and fails to take out wide hordes in a short period of time. Often leaving the weapon feeling underwhelming. Even when pack-a-punched, the weapon suffers the same issues, but does better damage at the very least. The third variant involves my favorite element, plasma. The die thermophasic can be obtained by completing a few steps of the easter egg and then activating this dark ether tear. By collecting this fuse under the plane wing and activating this box cut in the deadshot room, players will be able to utilize the weapon. To quote Carver, <laughs> It shoots fireballs. You know what that means, don't you? It shoots fireballs. Someone gets paid to write this stuff. <laughs> I can applaud that level of work. 
Regardless, the thermophasic shoots powerful bolts of plasma that are supposed to decimate high HP targets with low pierce. So basically a glorified Megaton killer. And just like the previous two variants, the weapon underperforms in this category too. With low pierce and surprisingly low damage for a boss killer, there's a reason no one remembers this version of the die. Even Pack-a-Punch, the weapon isn't exactly all that effective at its one job, with the Ring of Fire and a Gallo being just as efficient of a combo. And finally, there's the Die Electro Bolt. By completing steps of the Easter Egg and activating the Dark Ether Tear in the Cyclotron Room, players will be able to traverse the Fallen Landscape and absorb various yellow crystals, shooting them back into this box located by Pack-a-Punch. Performing this action three times will reward players with easily the best variant. The Electro Bolt fires a concentrated beam of electricity. After firing for a few seconds, the weapon will begin to fire triple its ammunition, and producing beams that do triple the damage. While it has low pierce like its brethren, the high damage output easily makes up for that. And for some reason, this die variant is the only one to come with an added movement bonus when firing. Why the others don't, I have no idea. But look at how fast you can go. Sonic would be proud. And other than the Electro Bolt, it's highly recommended players just use the base Shockwave, as its damage output is the most effective of the bunch. Which is kinda sad to see. For the first map, it's a shame the best version of a 4 Wonder Weapon concept is its base variant. Hopefully this won't happen again, but we'll get to that when we get to Naruto Toten. Thankfully, players are able to switch their variant on the fly, by simply interacting with the corresponding variant holding cells. As stated earlier, the die is simply underwhelming, with three of its five variants being nothing more than quest fodder. Toward the end of the game's lifespan, the developers finally allowed the weapon to be pack-a-punched, increasing the weapon's overall ammo capacity, charge rate per zombie, and damage output. And even then, the Electro Ball and the Shockwave continue to outperform their brethren by miles, with the base Shockwave being more than enough to sustain players in the high rounds. So it makes you wonder, what's the point of the elemental variants then? I wish I could tell you. It's a very similar issue with that Alpha Omega faces with its regular Mark II variants, but that's a problem we'll discuss in an Alpha Omega review. And who can forget about the revamped Ray Gun? Coming off of Black Ops 4, the Ray Gun had been receiving weaker and weaker returns, but coming back to Cold War, the Ray Gun's damage output was massively increased. Originally, the base shot had the ability to one-shot a standard zombie on any round, but after nerfs and health pool patches, the weapon now fares okay at any round. But with Ring of Fire, will continue to one-shot, making the Specialist ability extremely important in high rounds. The weapon has returned to its former glory as the series Wonder Weapon, but unlike previous entries, it is extremely hard to get out of the mystery box. Then there's the map soundtrack. While music is subjective, besides Kevin Sherwood's alone, many of the tracks feel rather generic, and many of the good ones are just reused from campaign, which isn't a bad thing. Bell on the Inside, used during Orlov's memory sequence, is a beautiful track, and I don't blame the team for reusing it. In Firebase Z, one of the map's best tracks, besides Lost, also comes from the campaign. Honestly, this section just started out as me talking about BO4's music in comparison to Cold War, but that would be unfair and disingenuous to Kevin, Jack, and Brian, and the rest of the sound department. The struggles the team went through during Cold War were different than the ones encountered during BO4. D Machina's OST features a ton of background music produced by the sound department at Treyarch and Bell on the inside. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The music fits very well, and it probably saved them some resources by getting to reuse the tracks. But, let's use the discussion about the map's music selection to talk about one of D-Machina's main problems, and that's the map's identity, or lack thereof. This is a discussion that's more prominent in Firebase Z and Forsaken, but I'll touch on it here. D-Machina just isn't a memorable experience. It's a fun one, no doubt, 
but not one I'm always itching to play like Nine Shadows or Kino. And that mostly has to do with the developers simply playing it safe for their first map back after Black Ops 4. And this might have to do with the game's rough development. I believe D Machina suffers from an identity crisis because of time and resources. It's an alright map, and honestly, it's the game's second best map, but it's not doing anything to really wow the players. The locale of the Nazi bunker is cool, until you realize that besides the particle accelerator and the ability to transfer between the dark ether through ethereal tears, D Machina is just another abandoned facility, and a pretty boring one at that. There isn't some theater of the dead brought to life by the technology left behind by Group 935, an overrun Russian cosmodrome left abandoned by a government fighting a war with the West, or a decimated moon facility that's still operational by a little girl hiding within a pyramid. This is just some Nazi bunker, and one the game wants you to believe is important. But even during the Easter egg, there's nothing that keeps players engaged in the location of D Machina because there's nothing our playable characters get to interact with. The reason Nine works so well is because the Chaos crew interacts with the player and the crowd around them as much as the player interacts with the character and the environment. The world is caricatured and bombastic. People like Diego Nicali are larger than life, yet somehow the events unfolding around him are even larger. <laughs> Cower before me! I have the fire of the god! Good. The world of Derizendrock feels nuanced because our characters are invested in the actions we make them take. Our crew attempts to crack jokes and find some levity in the situation thrusted upon them, but because of their badass demeanor, we feel just as cool as they do. Despite Buried's quiet appearance, colorful characters like Leroy really help to bring the map to life, and that's ignoring all the different ways you can play the map within its play space. D Machina is just another zombies map, but maybe that's the point a solid return to form to remind players why they're invested in the series in the first place. So, how do we improve upon this issue? Well, I believe the map could have developed a lot of character if we had actual characters to play as, so let's discuss some ideas I had on what characters to include on the map and how each of them would tie into a central theme of Cold War. I believe the leaders of Requiem would have been perfect playable characters, Carver, Strauss, Weaver, and Grey. If these characters were our playable crew, I believe this would have brought a ton of life to the map. Mackenzie Carver is characterized as your stereotypical hard-ass military colonel, a logical man who has seen his fair share of warfare. Taking a page out of Scarlet from the Chaos storyline, getting to see his worldview become shattered by the experiments and mind-blowing technology found would be rather interesting. The Dark Aether is supposed to be this world-shattering event, so having a character whose entire worldview is changed would help emphasize this theme. I'm starting to lose track of where I am. Getting worried my life is unraveling. Oscar Strauss originally worked the facility, as expressed in some of his map's early round dialogue. Craig could have written him as a guilt-ridden scientist who had become a part of this mission as a means to atone for his past sins. Especially during the Easter egg, his character could have helped us explore the themes of regret in following orders, and the theme is introduced during the Easter egg with a Russian named Orlov, an Omega soldier forced against his will to repower the cyclotron, despite the horrors it would oppose upon humanity. Sadly, this theme is so lightly touched upon, you almost forget about it by the time the map is over. Elizabeth Gray is a wide-eyed scientist who sees the Dark Aether as an exciting new opportunity, using her naivety as a good starting point to talk about the horrors of warfare and the severity of the atrocities the Nazis committed during the war, even creating some interesting conflict between her and Strauss. And finally, there's Grigory Weaver, a character originally from the campaign. Weaver could have explored what it means to change sides and become exiled from one country of origin. The Cold War was full of double agents and moles. Much like the lack of trust premise Richthofen initially had with the rest of the team at the start of Black Ops 3, we could have seen this theme portrayed again through Carver, a loyal American soldier who might not exactly trust his commanding officer and his teammates, specifically Strauss and Weaver one a Nazi, and the other a defected Russian during the Cold War. A major theme can be about building trust between allies, one that goes beyond nationality and prejudice. I don't believe I'm being overly ambitious here. The themes of defection and doing the right thing are explored through the characters of Sergei Ravinov, a character found in Firebase Z. Despite his lack of decorum, 
I believe Ravanov is sincere in his intentions to help us. He may be Spetsnaz, but he's no Omega puppet. He's on our side, I hope. At the end of the day, the work that would have gone into these ideas affects character quotes and storyline, something Craig Houston has proved to be very capable of doing, even on a budget. Alpha Omega has eight different characters, and even when strapped for time, Craig made the unlikely team up between Primus and Ultimus work really well. At the very end of the map, they met the Primus version. So we had Primus and Ultimus face to face. Where are we going to go from there? Well, guess what idiot Craig decided? <laughs> let's put them all in one map and double the narrative workload. So that's what we did. Well, let's let's talk to idiot. Two and a half thousand is, is, is probably an average. We've gone up above that sometimes on maps like Revelations. And that's split between our principal characters and any kind of audio logs or guest appearances that we might have. Um, for Alpha Omega, it's actually about five and a half thousand yeah. lines. I believe this would have massively improved the map and its character by using the playable characters as a way to express some of the game's overall themes. And finally, let's talk about the Easter egg. One of the egg's greatest strengths is its insistent use to throw players into the dark ether. The realm is beautiful and always keeps players' attention while exploring the region. It's probably one of the map's most recognizable traits next to its easy to pick up and play approach. Sadly, the only way for players to enter the Dark Aether is to participate in the map's main quest. But the egg itself? Well, it's pretty short. The quest primarily involves around players repowering the Durweschler, a machine capable of restoring cognitive functions in the undead, similar to the abilities of the Elemental Shard from Alpha Omega. The first step involves players activating Pack-a-Punch and scavenging resources around the Dark Aether to create an Aetherscope, a device that can be used to view ethereal specters. With this device, we get introduced to Dr. Vogel, head scientist at Project End Station. With information learned from his diary, we get the password to turn on the Jerweschler. Fun fact, the ghost models used for the ethereal spectres are the exact same from Blood of the Dead. At least in terms of modeling with the little eye effects. Now players must power the device with each of the die's four upgrades. The next step, when powered, involves players re-entering the Dark Aether and locating the device's decontamination device, which was stolen by thieves. Somehow interacting with this tank, aids us in knocking down the device hidden high within the tree. <sighs> Once the device is returned, players are able to absorb two Megaton halves into the machine. Or should I say, D-Machine. Once consumed, the Megaton reforms into Orlov, and justifiably, he returns confused and broken. Running off into the darkness, players are able to find a photo of his left behind in the dark ether, and revealing it to him helps him regain his humanity in this pretty bittersweet scene. Orlov, now determined, wants to help the player in destroying the Cyclotron, in an attempt to atone for his sins and repair the damage he has caused. And with that, the map's boss fight begins. Orlov aids the player in overloading the Cyclotron to prevent more breaches. While interacting with the various mechanisms and failsafes, players must protect Orlov from the undead horde. Surprisingly, able to differentiate between a zombie on their side 
and an enemy. Pretty interesting world building. During each phase, an enemy called the Mayak Overlord will appear. The Mayak oozes Megaton blasters and bombers in the hopes of overrunning the player. Despite the insanity, Orlov cannot actually be killed by the undead, simply halted, making the fight much easier than initially anticipated. And with the room containing an armor stand, players are able to take their time and complete this final step at their leisure. Once the final failsafe is bypassed, the facility begins to melt down, with Orlov staying behind as there's no world left for him to return to in the state that he's in. It is finished. You must go now. And someday, you will be my son and Archer. Tell them, I will see them both again. Go now! That's all I with that, Weaver urges the players to escape in an epic final sequence that has players racing against the clock to arrive at the Exfil Zone, as the map is consumed in large blue flames. Once at the Exfil site, players are greeted by Raptor 1, with the facility finally melting down and exploding in a blue flare. Why it wasn't purple like everything else in this game is beyond me. But the map ends on a fantastical final note, but leaves players with nothing to indicate where the story is going next besides an ominous final word from Weaver. And to end off this part of the review, I wanted to leave a brief description of how the map plays. Think of it as a conclusion that takes everything we've talked about and describes how it all comes together in execution. The reason I feel this is important is because maps like Revelations and Tortured Path have so many ideas, but fail in execution when actually played. Revelations feels clunky and the map design leaves areas separated and disjointed. It feels like six tinier maps that players can bounce between, with no overall theme or layout combining them all besides the literal portals and bounce pads connecting each area. And then there's the Tortured Path, which tries to be a completely different game mode, but collapses under the weight of the core gameplay of World War II and the difficulty and speed of the challenges thrown at the player. So how is the execution of Dean Machina? I think it all comes together nicely. The map offers an easy and carefree early round approach, allowing players new and old to turn on power, activate Pack-a-Punch without trouble. Once complete, there are many various side quests awaiting the player. There's the Free Die, the Map's Main Quest, the Juggernaut Coffin Dance Easter Egg, the Dark Aether, the Wonder Weapon Elemental Variants, Intel Hunting, and of course, who forget about High Rounds. Many of these events flow nicely into one another, and are all relatively easy to perform. And then there's the High Rounds themselves. The die is quite effective, and in tandem with the crafting table and ammo boxes, players are able to play how they desire this level of freedom being last achievable on Buried, albeit under different conditions. Buried is a sandbox of opportunity, and Dean Machina is a simple return to form that offers easy to complete side quests that rewards players handsomely for small amounts of dedication, but doesn't pull them away from the action, unlike maps like Dead of the Night, which required players to take the time to solve puzzles and complete small events just to do something as simple as Pack-a-Punch. Dean Machina also offers a ton of open training areas and makeshift camping spots so choosing a viable option for high round is all up to player preference. The play space is quite moderate, and getting from one side of the map to the other isn't all too difficult, with very few areas cornering the player, like the trial machine room. By the time players reach round 20, they'll also encounter a new enemy type, the Armored Zombie, an enhanced foe who mitigates damage with the aid of armor, just like the one players are wearing. And by high rounds, Ring of Fire is a must-have to effectively deal with Megaton swiftly. But even past round 51, the map's open play space makes dealing with super sprinters much easier than it is on maps like Voyage of Despair or Ancient Evil. But overall, D Machina doesn't pull any unfair punches, and is about as friendly as a zombie's map can get. From its easy to pick up and play approach, to a vast variety of side easter eggs and content to keep players busy, D Machina is exactly what the series needed after Black Ops 4. And while the map is lacking an extremely distinct identity most Treyarch maps wear with pride, D Machina is an excellent return to form, and helps pave the way for many of the game's new features. But with all that said, let's take a trip to Vietnam and explore the Omega facility known as Outpost 25, Firebase Z. Requiem Alpha site just went nuclear. Zilni has been destroyed. Good work, Strike Team. We've closed the breach. But I got a feeling Omega Group is just getting started. Hurrah! Requiem! Welcome to Vietnam! Coming from the Polish mountains to the always orange Vietnam, Firebase Z is the second map on our zombies adventure. So how does this map carry on the torch lit by D Machina? 
Well, let's talk about it. Following the events of Firebase Z, a bit has happened in the story. After the events of D Machina, Samantha Maxis goes undercover in an attempt to rendezvous with a Soviet defector by the name of Sergei Ravanov. While at the facility, she learns the ultimate extent of Omega's plans, to bridge the gap between the Dark Aether and harness its resources to turn the tide to the Cold War. Like Peter McCain before her, Samantha is captured, tortured, and then subsequently thrown into the Dark Aether. Over the next two days, the facility begins to be overrun by legions of the undead, leaving it in the decayed stay players arrive to. Soon learning of Samantha's disappearance, Weaver tasked the strike team with two goals, rendezvous with Ravanov and rescue Samantha Maxis. Unlike many of the maps before it, Firebase Z features a concurrent narrative that uses the state of the Cold War to rapidly experiment with different concepts and ideas. The Ethereum arms race is a theme introduced in the map and keeps the audience engaged in Omega's achievements. The intel attempts to make the group a legitimate threat, and unlike the nebulous and oftentimes lofty storytelling of the Keepers and the Apothecans, players are able to visualize why these threats matter and what they're up against if unchecked. Omega could use these technologies to win the war and take over the world. They're surprisingly more grounded than you think. These are people with their own interests and goals besides just galactic conquest and time loops, and for zombies, I feel like it's a really good step back to ground the story. So far, the breaches have been uncontrolled, which greatly restricted our ability to take advantage of this new dimension. But, but, if we are able to open our own stabilized gateway that operates under our control? Well, I mean, come on. We'll be the first with free reign to pilfer, pillage, and plunder an alien world, untainted and ripe with resources ready for extraction. It will give us a considerable edge over my former countrymen. Good riddance to them. Pack here, personal log, March 19th. After weeks of phasic misalignment resulting in numerous anatomical displacements, today marked our first successful teleportation test. And I'm sure Private Pashkov was happy to arrive with all parts intact. After the generators last month, this marks the second milestone achievement for Outpost 25. But enough about that. Let's talk about the map's overall design and presentation. Unlike the quiet and still Dean Machina, Firebase Z attempts to be livelier and uses the characters of Sergei Ravanov and William Peck to elevate the map's storytelling to varying degrees of success. The map features a similar desolated atmosphere, but for once is actually inhabited by real human beings who both aid and hinder the player at every turn during the map's main quest. Ravanov and Peck tell the story of allegiance, loyalty, and betrayal of one's nation. Peck for his own selfish endeavors, and Ravanov for the perceived greater good. Peck being a larger-than-life scientist, and Ravanov being a loyal soldier who finds himself on the wrong side of the battlefield. These two characters make for a great contrast. Sadly, Ravanov comes off as an extremely forgettable stoic leader, and he offers very little substance besides its banter with Weaver. And Peck comes off as an extremely goofy narcissist, and oftentimes too comedical for his own good. But I'll tell you right now, Goofy is easily the more memorable of the two personalities. Sadly, these characters steal much of the screen time from Carver, Strauss, and Gray, leaving their characters just as stagnant as they were in Deep Machina. And finally, there's the character of Samantha Maxis. Unlike Ravanov and Peck, Samantha only plays a primary role in the map towards the end of the map's easter egg and at the intel. Through said intel, we get to see Samantha's courage, fear, insanity, and mental breakdown. While not something groundbreaking, it's a great opportunity to see this character explored, Although by the time we get to know who Samantha is, she basically becomes a different character that remains that way for the rest of the story. She's originally characterized in Demachina's intel as tactical, intelligent, and a well-spoken infiltrator. She's obviously been through a lot, and is consistently mindful of others despite their flaws and her own. Hate to break it to you, but this event isn't an isolated incident. Russian forces are mobilizing in multiple locations across the world, and right now, you're weeks, if not months, behind them. I wasn't. Weaver's half Russian. I'm German. Who are you fighting in World War II? You sure you know who the enemy is now? But by the end of Firebase Z, and going forward, Samantha is a broken, platitude-spouting mess, believing she doesn't deserve happiness. I am just, I am only me.
Don't think I'm a bad person. I'm not. I am a good soul. But I have to do what I'm going to do. What I need to do. I've seen darkness. I've lived through it. Even when I saw no hope for a new dawn. Even in my dreams I saw darkness. As a quick aside, let's talk about Outbreak's Easter egg song, Lost. In a first of the series, the lyrics of the track were actually written by Craig Houston himself and sung by Samantha's voice actress, Julie Nathanson. Most zombies Easter egg songs tell non-specific narratives, but Lost takes us into the internal dialogue of Samantha Maxis while she is trapped in the dark ether, a song that reminisces on her past as an ethereal deity, who once controlled the undead the same as the Elder Gods do now. A song that reminds us that Samantha is just as powerful as she once was, but going insane once again. This is easily some of the music team's best work, and the narrative of the track plays right into the storyline. Then there's the map's aesthetic and level design. Unlike Dean Machina, Firebase Z is a rundown Omega facility, a place where the Russians experimented with Ethereum on their military equipment. And much like the issues that plague Dean Machina, the map doesn't exactly have any unique landmarks besides the Ethereum generators that are located around the map's three corners. The spawn area is simply a port of the one from the campaign, while the actual Firebase Z facility is uniquely built from the ground up making it technically the first Aether map since Gorod Krovi to feature a mostly original location. Pretty interesting if you think of it like that. Regardless, the map was uniquely built from the ground up, but a lot of the level's geometry and stylization blends in with the game's campaign. Which isn't always a bad thing, as Omega's firebase should resemble elements of Russia's military architecture found in said game mode. But instead of an art design that elevates the features and elements found in campaign, Firebase Z feels more like a map that could coexist within the campaign of multiplayer, and not a map that lends itself to the fantastical nature of zombies. Noct uses an entire building from the campaign, but utilizes atmosphere and lighting to set itself apart from its contemporary. Ascension is put together with the various different set pieces found between the campaign and multiplayer, but with the varied level design, lunar landers, and environment, or lack thereof, manages to be an extremely memorable location, and that's ignoring the map's special enemies, wonder weapons, easter egg quest, and core gameplay loop. Firebase Z doesn't share exact geometry with the campaign, besides the spawn room, but the map's weak art design feels like a campaign mission. But to the developer's credit, I believe that this was intentional to help create further cohesion between the three modes, and seeing what we've got next with the game's next three experiences, Crunch soon became an opportunity for the art team to stitch the three modes together, like some walking Frankenstein. Taking from its predecessor, Firebase Z is designed much like Doris, with the helipad leading players in three separate directions to each of the three generators that must be activated. To turn on Pack-a-Punch and restore the map's power, players must activate these generators by using the undead as a power source. These sections are quite simple and help progress players through the rounds without being too overly complicated. Completing these objectives awards players with an additional 500 points, making it very easy to open up the map, much like 9. Once turned on, players will have access to each of the map's various launch pads and applicable shortcuts. And as early as round 6, players can have the entire map open and ready to battle in. Much like Dean Machina, this type of gameplay progression meets a happy medium between Black Ops 3 and 4. Then there's our adversaries. For starters, there's the Mimic, or as we have to call him on stream, the Bargwa. Before we knew its name, my chat and I considered that the creature looked like a ball-like Margwa, and I believe the name fits quite well. And it's what I'll be calling it from here on out. The Margwa has the unique ability to turn into random objects and hide its presence from enemies before bursting to life and killing them. The model is beautiful to look at. I love all the different appendages that cover the creature's body. It features a long-range grapple attack where the beast will attempt to bite down on players for massive damage, and an electroshock projectile that I swear it never uses unless you're in a glitch spot or an outbreak. One of the creature's coolest abilities is the chance for it to mimic the various perk machines around the map. As cool as the Bargwit is though, it's extremely predictable. 
enemies don't naturally drop purple tier rarity items, besides the Casimir and self revives. So when you see a sentry turret on the ground, it feels like a Tom and Jerry skit, with an extremely obvious disguise. Like, wow, I wonder who's leaving a chopper gunner on the floor. The next enemy is the returning Russian Mangler. From its previous iterations in Gorod Krovi, the Mangler has seen some changes. For example, its suit of armor has been upgraded to reduce damage taken, much like an armor zombie, instead of just having an extended health bar. To destroy the enemy, players must shoot at the Mangler's arm cannon to cause massive damage. Originally, the cannon was shot off by shooting at the Mangler's shoulder, but in Firebase C, the cannon is destroyed by shooting at the actual cannon. This will cause major damage, and in most cases, kill the enemy. And unlike in Gorod Krovi, the Mangler's arm cannon shot doesn't actually track players' movement, making it much easier to dodge. The Mangler and Bargwa are considered special enemies, and just like the Megaton, these enemies produce ammo drops, which refill the player's ammo by 40% of their reserves. In high rounds, the constant special enemy spawn makes keeping a consistent ammo supply extremely simple. Like to talk about in D-Machina, this was the first map where ammo boxes became purely obsolete. I remember back on day one of the map, the special enemy spawn rate was cranked up to 11, and the gameplay style was so hectic I fell in love with it. It reminded me a lot of Nine's gameplay loop. Sadly, the special enemy spawn rate has been lowered, but I still feel that this insane style of gameplay fits the game mode quite well. And, if done correctly, it's the style of gameplay the series should keep moving towards, but that's just me. And finally, there's the returning Hellhounds. Now, unlike Jimmy Zielinski's speedy tormentors and Jason Lundell's popcorn airballs with the defense stat of a piece of paper, Cold War opts to go in a completely different approach for this enemy. Starting at round 25, Hellhounds in Cold War will attempt to run up to the player and self-destruct, leaving behind a deadly pool of napalm that can damage players if they stand within it for too long. Genuinely, I hate these things. Much like Chaos's Poison Catalyst, the Hellhound is supposed to prevent players' health from regenerating, making it easier for the undead and manglers to whittle away at the player's HP over time. But honest to god, I find their inclusion extremely irritating. Using speed as a benefactor to their abilities, Hellhounds are just frustrating to deal with, but we'll talk about that more when we get to Outbreak soon enough. Then there's the map's wonder weapon, the Ray K-84. According to Intel, the weapon was forged using pieces of the GKZ-45, the left half of the dual-wield ray gun Mark III from Gorod Krovi. Firing a piercing shot of Ethereum, the weapon's fast fire rate makes it a destructive force on the battlefield, but by pressing up on the D-pad, players are able to access the weapon's underbarrel Ethereum launcher. Firing a vortex of 115, the underbarrel slows enemies that enter its grasp. But much like the Mark III before it, if a player shoots into the vortex with the Ethereum rifle, they'll be able to unleash a destructive concussive blast that'll instantly kill any standard enemy. Man, between this and Gorod Krovi, the Mangler can simply not catch a break. I love the design of the Ray K. Much like the die, its handmade design works really well for what's considered a prototype weapon. One of the cooler steps in the Ray K quest is the I step. To access a computer from Dr. Kukle, the scientist who designed the Ray K, players have to dig an eye out of his corpse in this neat little scene. In the land of the blind. I quite like the Ray K in combat. It's extremely effective against the map's special enemies, and the constant ammo drops make you feel like you're in a Rambo movie. Next up, there's the map's special round. For a first in Treyarch's Zombies mode, there's an all-new special round that is not the titular special enemy max ammo round, an objective-based round like in the Tortured Path, or any of AW's special rounds. There's the Ethereum Reactor Assault Waves. Happening once every 10 or so rounds, players are told an ethereal terror is forming near one of the generators. Oftentimes, these corners of the map's play space would go unused. But in Firebase C, when an ethereal assault is happening, these areas are the battlegrounds. Players must defend an appropriate computer and the reactor from the zombie onslaught. Much like Balloon's Tower Defense 6's race mode, assault waves throw a high volume of enemies at the player over the course of a very quick time period. If the defense module is destroyed, the AI will soon attack the appropriate reactor. If destroyed, players must reactivate the reactor, with an increased fuel requirement of the undead needed to power the machine. Now, unlike many other special rounds, and events like the Origins Templars, Assault Waves do not spawn in any additional undead, and only the ones that pop out of the portals are the only enemies players must face. 
the first assault wave pits players simply against the undead. By the second assault wave in the 20s, players must face the undead alongside barguas and manglers. And finally, by round 30, the map's final enemy approaches, and one of Firebase Z's coolest aspects. Whiskey Tango fucking A. Just how big is that thing? I don't care how big it is. Strike Team, bring it down. Orda, a dark ether elder god and servant of the Forsaken, Orda is a corpse-ridden demon who seeks to destroy the Ethereum reactors at all cost. In order to complete the round, players must eliminate the beast before the undead overrun them. One of the fight's best moments is when Orda approaches for the first time. Players aren't quite able to get a good look at the creature, and if players are fighting Orda off the coast of Speed Cola, the effect is amplified. The way the creature slowly breaches the phase, the magnificent height it reaches, and the Requiem Strike team's fear truly sets the scene for COD Zombie's first non-Easter egg boss encounter. Besides Oz. Yeah, you're welcome, Kara. Orda has various different attacks. A sonic scream that sends swarms of locusts at the player, but leaves the beast vulnerable. A hell hell and arm cannon. An energy blast that can quickly destroy the Ethereum reactor, if players are allowed to get too close. And it also just simply stops on players like the Origins robot. Regardless of the outcome, Orda will return the next time an assault wave happens, adding another layer of complexity to an already fun round. If successfully defended, players will receive a max ammo and carpenter for their troubles. The Ethereum Assault Waves bring something completely new to the table, and I wouldn't mind seeing more of it in the future. It's clear the round was very well thought out, and even reaches back to the original roots of zombies being planned as a tower defense game mode. One of the biggest complaints about the round, though, comes from Orda's health being unfairly balanced in 3-4 player co-op games, with the health cap being absurdly high and nigh unbeatable for a major portion of the year. But hopefully we're past that issue now. Fun fact, these zombies are actually being sent by Samantha. In various pieces of intel found in Outbreak, it's highly implied that while trapped in the Dark Aether, Samantha was the one who sent the undead at the base, and is the cause of the Ethereum Assault Waves. I don't know how or why, but I am remembering. I was angry before, and I, I am so sorry. That wasn't me. If it was, it, it really wasn't who I wanted to be. Do you think I'm lying to you, Major Carver? No. But I am concerned about the content of some transmissions you sent while you were in the Dark Aether. Some of them seem to imply that you yourself might have caused the outbreak at Outpost 25. I don't know how that would be possible. Do you? Requiem are very interested in the... gaps in your memory regarding the events at Outpost 25. Particularly its destruction and the question of your role in it. I was angry and confused. But that doesn't mean I could somehow unleash all the forces of the Dark Aether upon Omega. I don't want to upset you. Why? Are you worried I'll destroy everything like you think I did at Outpost 25? Weaver! This is further backed up by the map's ending theme, which features the OG Zombies laugh last heard on Moon in Nuketown. This theme was seemingly picked because this is the most recent map where Samantha had control over the undead. A simple audio cue, but an amazing one for sure, that calls back to the game's past. Now that's how you do a reference. And finally, there's the map's easter egg. After turning on power and pack-a-punch, players must interrogate the two characters to learn more about the actual firebase and a method to get Pack to tell the player how to find Samantha. After speaking with Ravanov and collecting and mixing various chemicals, Players drug the mad scientist with the truth serum, and easily one of the map's best and worst scenes. Although through the delusion, we learn more about Peck's psychotic nature, and the falling out that he has with his wife. 
After further pressing, Peck reveals to Requiem how to locate Maxis, using a device that can extract memories. As work continued on Outpost 25, Dark Aether miners continued to show continued side effects, which included signs of decay, radiation poisoning, and in some cases, intense memory loss after a prolonged or multiple excursions to the Dark Aether. Following this, Peck developed the Memory Transference device to recover these memories. Alongside the Truth Serum, I actually really like this aspect of zombies. Regardless of the form it takes, I love seeing all of these neat mythological and sci-fi concepts explored. You have the standard zombie, but there's also entities like Ghost and Mob of the Dead, Gorod's Dragons, Voyage's Iceberg taking the form of the Eye of Odin, Ancient Evil's Perseus, a literal demigod, and Medusa, Rogue AI and Alpha Omega, the Victus comics is Bios, cults like The Order and organizations like Illuminati and Group 935, Truth Serum and autonomous talking guns like in Mauer, a Dark Aether god turned shield in Terra Maldicta, Shangri-La and then the Darius to Canada to Toten time travel, Origins is 1,000 foot tall robots, Durizen Jock's rocket barrage, and so much more. I really don't think people give enough credit to the creativity the team has and continues to have over the years. The memory transference device, while goofy and a tad too convenient for the scenario that we're in, was a machine that made me realize that Treyarch has never stopped trying. And I appreciate that, despite what some people at home might think. Because at the end of the day, these are still people. So now let's talk about the Bargwa Hunt. To locate the specific memories needed, players must scour the map for piles of uninteractable pieces of equipment. These can spawn in plenty of areas around the map, and even in spawn. Once found, players must lower the specific Bargwa's health to under 10% and capture it essentially using a Pokemon Pokeball. Once captured, players can return the specimen to the device and extract the memories of Sokolov, Brahms, and Sabine. If players accidentally kill the creature, fail to capture it, or fail to locate it within the round, players will have to flip the rounds for another chance at the step. This must be completed three times over three separate rounds to progress. While I might not consider it difficult, I know plenty of people have found difficulty in this step purely because the low threshold players must meet to actually capture the Bargwa. But if you take your time, it really isn't that hard. Once completed, players must collect the data found and insert it into a computer near the OPC. Players must now interrogate Peck once again, and learn that they must collect additional Ethereum crystals to power the portal. These crystals can be found by completing various little side quests. This is easily my favorite part of the egg. They're simple little challenges, but each require something different. The first crystal can be found near the helipad, by digging up said crystal, players can initiate a game of Spot the Difference. The difference being the lack of black spots in the correct crystal. I will say though, I would have loved to have Winter's Whale for this step like this in Solo. It's kind of hard to search every crystal with a zombie on you. The next crystal can be found off in the jungle defense. To complete the objective, players must simply survive an onslaught of manglers and hellhounds, with the real challenge being health regeneration. Fun fact, despite the poison barrier around the lockdown, Players far away from that side of the map don't even experience any form of damage. And then finally there's the third crystal, which begins teleporting around the medbay. To capture said crystal, players must use the Ethereum Vortex of the Reikai. I also just love this idea that these crystals have their own personalities, and wish to make Requiem's lives a living hellscape. I really like these steps. The crystals aren't this Herculean ordeal to obtain, and they just take a little bit of thinking if you don't have the guide. This stuff is a brain teaser to learn, but easy to replicate, like any good step B. Because something like this, like this, like this, or this, needs to stop showing up. Those steps are lengthy, confusing, and oftentimes require an internet guide to understand and replicate. I believe the direction Cold War is taking with its quest lines is a good one. Once you collect the crystals and insert them into each generator, the facility will overload and the OPC will shut down, with Peck taunting players that their truth serum mixture wasn't fully effective, and he was able to get them to overload the facility and prevent any chance of them rescuing Maxis. In a final bid to save her, Weaver uses a satellite beam found in Outbreak's objective eliminate to overload the facility and repower the portal. I uh, really don't get how that works, but sure, why not? What the hell is that? Are you firing a goddamn space laser at my satellite dish? And with that, the team was able to extract Samantha Maxis out of the Dark Aether. Despite only being inside for 48 hours, it's implied Samantha spent what seemed like months, if not years, inside the Dark Aether, to the point of slowed speech and memory loss, much like many of the Ethereum miners that went in before her. I love the little minute details about her body language and speech in this mid-game cutscene. 
Like the way that Sam is barely able to mutter the word Weaver, almost as if she's completely forgotten. It's some great writing, even if it's simple. Sam? What happened to you? I recognize Zed's voice. Weaver. You are. As the OPC begins to overload, the characters escape back to the village, where they rendezvous with Ravanov and proceed to escape before being blocked in by Orda. The Orda boss fight is just kind of okay. Unlike the Orda encounter in the Ethereum Assault Waves, this Orda instead aims to stop players. The only new attack is that the creature gains the ability to slam its arm across the battlefield. This will instantly down standard players, but if you keep towards the back, it's pretty simple. Wait, is Orda dead? Oh yeah, I forgot this boss fight's a joke. Uh, anyways, Orda is not much of a threat. Although, besides the Oz boss fight found in Descent, this is the first COD Zombies boss fight with a health bar. Wait, there's health bars in Torture Path too. Okay, fine, the third COD Zombies boss fight with a health bar. It's a small detail, but I really like it. It's a weird feeling, but I like knowing how far I am in a fight. And unlike games like Cuphead, which feature phase changes to signify damage and progress, not every COD Zombies boss is in need of a phase change and a fight like Orda's is perfect for a health bar. But I can completely understand thinking it's superfluous. My favorite HUD is BO4 is because I like information, and it's also why you should never take my opinion seriously. And finally, there's the map's outro cutscene. Following their victory over Orda, the team makes their way to the exfil point, with Samantha in tow, who is surprisingly more cognitively functional than she was mere moments ago. Try not to break anything else. With a tease for Project Threshold in the Ural Mountains, Fans are given something to look forward to, with the inevitable release of their open world mode, Outbreak. Samantha and the team exfil with an additional part of the cutscene showing us what happened on Peck's side of the story. In the map's final moments, we are introduced to Alexandria Valentina, head scientist at Omega, and Lev Kravchenko from the Black Ops 1 campaign, an enigma of a man who somehow survived this. Granted, so did Woods. As the leader of Omega, Kravchenko makes the perfect foil for Weaver, especially considering the two have unfinished business following an encounter they have in Black Ops 1, with Kravchenko cutting out Peck's eye the same he did to Weaver. Sadly, little is done with this concept, as Weaver is never given the opportunity to enter the field, like Kravchenko, Valentina, and Peck are. And just like D-Machina, I really like this Easter egg, granted for completely different reasons. The quest has good pacing, some good flow, and experiments with some interesting concepts. And Samantha Maxis taking center stage again as one of the story's primary characters is a concept I'm surprised it took them over 12 years to do something with. And to end to this section, how does the map actually play? Much like Dean Machina, I feel the map's primary level flow works really well. The map is designed great and areas seamlessly flow between one another. The Reike is relatively simple, although a tad cumbersome with the dartboard step. And overall, leveling up your weaponry is extremely easy. The Wonderfizz and Pack being at spawn gives players a reason to return to the area, and the Easter egg can be done alongside map progression if players choose to do so. The Ethereum Assault Waves are a nice change of pace, and while they interrupt gameplay, they're a nice breakup from the standard formula. I'd say that Firebase Z has all the right components to be a really good zombies map. It has a pretty unique location, and this is the first time we'd see the team re-tackle the Vietnam idea first intended for Black Ops 1. Although from the returning Manglers, to the Ray K being another Ray Gun variant, to the map not exactly reaching the high standards set by other experiences, Firebase Z fails just before the finish line. Like Vanguard Shinonuma, nothing it does is by all means done poorly. It's not a bad map by any means, but sadly a forgettable one for sure, which is weirdly a crime not familiar with the game mode. With the map lacking that Treyarch flair, how does the team follow up these ideas, and more, in their next big experience, Outbreak? Not the AW map, of course. Like, why did they name the mode this? Sam, are you okay? I'm ready to come in, Weaver. We have a lot to talk about. Welcome back, Strike Team. Let's go get him.
Outbreak. Where to begin with such a game mode? Following the release of Firebase Z, just one month later, Treyarch would unveil to the public the open-world objective-based game mode known as Outbreak. Taking the Fireteam and combined arms maps found in multiplayer as the mode's primary level design, Outbreak takes players into various regions in the Ural Mountains found in Russia, a region in North Africa, and finally, a region in the Atlantic Ocean to battle the undead and push forward the Ethereum's arms race. So, what's the story? Following their successive raid on Outpost 25, Requiem, still falling behind in the war with Omega, plan to breach enemy lines and perform research in some of Russia's biggest outbreak zones found in the Ural Mountains. The director of Requiem, alongside Weaver, assign tasks to each of the Requiem operators to push forward their stake in the war. These tasks become the primary objectives that players fight through. Characters like Samantha Maxis have been placed in quarantine following the event of Firebase Z, and Ravenov is attempting to fight the good fight and prevent Omega from reaching world domination. Dr. Peck has also been assigned to the Ural Mountains to assess the use of Ethereum crystals at the site. And through Intel, we're further introduced to who all of these characters are. Outbreak started out with three maps and five objectives and plenty of minor events and enemies coming from D-Machina and Firebase C. The game mode also introduced the all new enemies, the Krasny Soldat and the Tempest. Obvious reinventions of the Panzer Soldat and the Avogadro. The Tempest is a ranged foe who seeks to whittle away at players over time like ethereal snipers. Tempest fire long-ranged lightning bolts and teleport away if approached. They can shut down various machines and vehicles if given the chance to do so. If players shoot enough at a Tempest chest, they will reveal a weak point. And finally, there's the Krasny Soldat. Sporting a jetpack, flamethrower, and flame pod launcher, the Krasny Soldat will burn a player's health pool to zero if left unattended to. Unlike the intimidating iterations of this classic foe, because of the armor system, the Krasny Soldat can barely keep up before being murdered. The best the enemy can do is scare players and prevent health regeneration like a lot of ranged enemies in this game. The Krasny Soldat can also be halted by destroying the enemy's protective helmet and blowing up its jetpack, causing the enemy to flail about as it puts out the fire on its back. Outbreak slightly changes and shakes up Cold War's base mechanics. Points go from 90 and 115 per zombie to 25 and 35 respectively, and players earn additional points and salvage by completing the map's various objectives, giving them further incentive to explore the map and not rush set a main objective. This change in the point formula forces players to explore every map to their fullest. Although, because of each map's enormous size, this drastically slows down the gameplay and completely changes how players approach the game mode. So how does the team take all these changes in these open-world maps? Well, let's find out. Outbreak sports a total of seven different maps. Golova, Ruka, Alpine, Sanatorium, Duga, and Zoo in the Ural Mountains, Collateral North Africa, and finally Armada in the Atlantic Ocean. Each of these maps are quite large in size and typically boast three known side objectives and one main objective that is required for players to progress further into the rounds. In terms of map aesthetic, each Outbreak map is slightly outfitted to feel more like a standard zombies adventure, with this effect being achieved by placing corpses and bloodstains all over each map. Alongside this are the various objectives that make up the mode, more or less, these maps feel like their multiplayer equivalents. This criticism has been levied against the mode by countless players, with many of them claiming it makes the maps feel lackluster. In my opinion, the art direction of Outbreak is much like the art direction of Firebase Z. Efficient. This was most likely done to save on resources, as Outbreak was a massive undertaking for the team. Although I have very little experience in the development of Call of Duty, much less the development cycle of Outbreak, it's difficult to determine how much work actually went into this mode, regardless of its ability to feel like a zombie's experience. But I know someone who is! Hi, yes, hello, it's me, John YouTube. While I'm certain that we'll never get any official comment on it, development of Outbreak can be reasonably assumed to have begun at least a couple months before Cold War's release, due to the fact that there were assets specific to that mode left in the game's memory at launch. When ripping assets for renders in November of that year, I distinctly remember these large loot chest models that weren't found anywhere in D Machina or Fireteam Dirty Bomb. It wasn't until Outbreak launched did it finally click. Oh, these must have been left in by accident. Now it's likely that these were only left in because of the Coffin Dance Easter Egg. When you do that Easter Egg, you open a medium loot chest and it has the exact same model, animations, and effects work of those later found in Outbreak. 
I imagine that with how much less time Treyarch had to work on this project compared to Black Ops 3 and 4, it must have been much easier and more time efficient on them to just quickly reuse the associated scripts, models, and animations for this little easter egg instead of creating new assets from the ground up, especially with how modular Cold War Zombies is under the hood. But it did have the side effect of revealing that Outbreak was in some stage of production before launch. And with that, let's hand it back off to Stanley. Hey, thanks, Rizzo. Then there's the gameplay. Outbreak divides players all across the play space. Depending on the objective and their placements, players are drawn in different directions nearly every game, giving the mode high replay value initially. As players complete objectives, they can search the land, finding loot boxes, loot chests, and side objectives, some indicated on the map and others only indicated on the mini-map by proximity. The name of the game is scavenging and frame of choice. Found a large structure? Well, there's sure to be a loot box and a special enemy hiding within. Need to restore your armor? You can make your way across the map to the dedicated Ivan machine, or you'll find some pieces inside loot chest as you patrol the play space. Need to upgrade your weapon's rarity and pack a punch level? Well, complete one of the many applicable side quests to earn points and Ethereum tools. Feel as if running around the map doesn't get you where you need to go in a timely manner? Well, take one of the map's various vehicles and Mad Max away earning additional points for road raging into the undead. Or maybe taking a jump pad is more your style. While in the air, you can soar into essence caches to net additional points. One of the game mode's greatest strengths is its level of ambition and player freedom. As the gameplay style of Call of Duty becomes stale as the years go on, this isn't the worst direction the series could have taken. Maps feel varied and the gameplay is well tested. In terms of main objectives, there's seven total. Eliminate, where players assist General Carver in eliminating a high value target or HVT. These enemies are buffed versions of standard special enemies with an increased health pool and a red coat of paint. Using the satellite beam shown in Firebase Z, HVTs are pulled out of the dark ether. Lowering their health causes them to retreat around the map and summon reinforcements. Holdout finds players destroying massive Ethereum crystals under Carver's orders. Attempting to destroy these crystals causes players to get sucked into the dark ether, where they must hold out in a Nox style bunker. Holding out for around 4 minutes wins players of the day. There's also this really cool animation of the crystals ascending when destroyed. Secure follows players aiding Dr. Strauss by collecting essence from the undead. Essence collected is formed into various rewards like points and score streaks. Fun fact! In Intel, it's confirmed that these rockets use the same technology found in QEDs to create randomized rewards. Granted, unlike QEDs, these rewards only aim to aid players. This establishes a connection with the objects in the dark ether dimension through a process called quantum entanglement. In layman's terms, the essence you collect is transformed into a dark ether object. Retrieve sends players towards two separate Ethereum caches. Once retrieved, these caches must be attached to a rocket and sent back to Requiem HQ for further testing. While in tow, the Ethereum canister will slow your movement to a crawl, but will allow players to output a burst of Ethereum, killing all in the nearby vicinity. Loading both canisters completes the objective. Transport puts players in the hands of a mobile Ethereum harvester truck. Players must deliver the payload to a vortex of primordial Ethereum in a short period of time. Filling both Ethereum crystals and transporting them to the rocket completes the objective. Personally, this one is the most flawed and half-baked. From its short timer to its rather buggy mechanics to players simply failing the entire run if the truck manages to flip over, transport is essentially the worst of the bunch. And it doesn't help that in essence, the objective is identical to retrieve in terms of mission goal. Just get two Ethereum caches and then just fill them up and get them to the rocket. I don't know, is redundant a good word? And finally, there's Dr. Gray's objectives. Defend has players retrieving an undead head and defending the specimen analyzer from onslaughts of the undead the head calls for. One of the most interesting aspects of this objective is the fact that the undead have the ability to summon backup in times of peril. This is one of the few times we see the undead acting more human than they initially let on. Some really interesting world building if you ask me. And finally, there's Escort. In this objective, Gray has deployed a recon rover, which is used to analyze how living creatures are affected by the Dark Aether. Protecting said rover, players must escort it to three different Dark Aether gateways. 
In a weird sense of variation, the rover has the opportunity to find two separate outcomes. In one outcome, the rover will simply not find an appropriate dark ether breach to enter, and will continue to search until it finds an adequate one. In another outcome, the rover will actually enter a dark ether entry and become rejected, changing the anatomy of the monkey the players were escorting, and forcing them to coordinate back with the rover. Which is weird, considering dark ether metamorphosis typically takes a bit longer than just a few seconds. You just get the ability to unlock more candles on it. Damn. Alright, what do you guys think monkey turned into monkey. first? A globe. Um, a Joe. Uh, After three successful portal encounters, the rover will enter the dark ether, completing the objective. Fun fact, the monkeys you aid during this step are actually the dark ether monkeys found in D-Machina and an outbreak. Overall, most of these objectives end up feeling bloated, with ones like defend and transport clearly overstating their welcome. Completing any of these objectives will activate a beacon across the map. At this beacon, players will find a Wonder Fizz, Pack-a-Punch, Ivan Armor Stand, a Crafting Table, and a Beacon. Interacting with this beacon will send players to the next map, increasing the difficulty much like a standard round-based map. If players destroy the beacon while teleporting, they'll actually be teleported two rounds ahead instead of one. While I wish there was a permanent beacon at the middle of each map, it's a terrific way to take all your hard work and turn it into profit. I can imagine this concept in mind when the developers were designing the game mode. Players aren't incentivized to stretch across the map's four corners to upgrade, and the beacon makes sense. It pushes players towards the main objective, as victory signifies an easy opportunity to upgrade your gear. But the main objective is typically the longest and toughest event in said map. And then there's all the side objectives. Three of these events will always appear on a player's map. Distress Call sees players investigating a group of dead Requiem soldiers. In an attempt to avenge our fallen comrades, players engage the group of the undead responsible. These enemies will typically roam in packs, and in higher rounds, enemies like the Mangler will even be in its HVT form. Completing this objective rewards players with a free perk can. Dragon Relic marks the return of the dragons from Dorizendrak. Players can pay 500 points for a chance to feed the dragon. As zombies are killed within its circle, the tanks on the rockets will fill up, dictating which reward chess players will get. If players manage to fill up the dragon all the way, they'll hear the Margwa sound effect and be rewarded with a gold chest, netting them a full power. According to a lost soul in the intel, who we'll discuss later, the undead fed are actually offered to the Forsaken, a dark ether god hell-bent on taking over the world. There is a machine I have seen in my crossings, a fiery mechanical dragon. The soldiers, they, they provide it with offerings of flesh. They are rewarded handsomely. They do not realize every offering is another soul for him to consume. They have made him more powerful than I thought possible. The Golden Chest event, or as I call it, the Tempest Chest, pits players against a large variety of the undead. If they are successful in winning the day, the Gold Chest will be opened, offering a full power and various other rewards. Fury Crystal grants players the opportunity to earn the coveted Aether Tool. An Aether Tool will upgrade a player's weapon one rarity stage. The advantage this tool gives is exponential if you're upgrading an Epic Tier weapon into a Legendary Tier, saving you 1,000 Rare Salvage, which I can't even describe how important that reward is in the early game. To complete this event, players must destroy the appropriate orange Ethereum Crystals that are scattered throughout the area. All of them hidden in doorways and bathrooms, hiding behind pieces of furniture or hiding within foliage, stuff like that. These crystals will make a twinkling sound effect as players get closer to them. And if the time runs out before players can destroy them all, they'll lose the chance to get the reward. This objective is absolutely trivialized by death perception. The Orda event sees Orda from Firebase Z roam the battlefield in a play space that allows the enemy to truly shine. If players engage, they'll encounter the Dark Aether Titan. Orda in Outbreak sports different abilities than his Firebase Z counterpart. He can slam the ground with his giant arm to deal massive damage, spew fragments of raw Ethereum to summon reinforcements and damage players, launch Hellhounds, swing its arm on the ground to distance players and cause a lot of damage, and spawn Swarm of Locusts that reveal a critical weak point. Orda's health will continue to scale with the rounds, making it increasingly tanky and unstoppable. If players attempt to fight Orda from a range or simply leave it alone for too long, the beast will siphon Ethereum from the Earth to heal itself. 
And don't forget, if you're too far away, your damage is cut by two-thirds. When defeated, Orta will drop a variety of rewards, wonder weapons, and even an Aether tool on high enough rounds. I really like the changes made to Orta. This wasn't some simple copy-paste from Firebase Z, and it's clear the team carefully considered what the enemy needed to properly fit into the mode. And I think a lot of their hard work pays off, even if weapons like the crossbow still haven't been properly tuned to actually scale with the boss in high rounds. And seriously, try killing Orta with a ballistic knife or crossbow in this day and age. I dare you. What am I doing, going, by the way? 2,000, that is not looking good for us, boys. I don't think I could kill him even if I wanted to. This does 1,000. This is actually still hurting him, though. This does. Keep in mind, a triple-packed weapon, by the way. 2,000, yeah, well. And finally, there's the Black Chest event. Throughout the year, players become acquainted with another tortured soul in the intel by the name of Peter. Much like a soldier named Zykov, the man from the D-Machina intro who originally shut down the Particle Accelerator, Peter loses sight of his squad while exploring the Dark Aether and becomes trapped, exposing himself to the elements and going insane. Along his travels, he attempts to return home while hiding inside of a golden chest. Upon returning, his soul is transformed, becoming a ghastly specter. During the Black Chest event, players must destroy the locks that bind him. These locks take the form of Locust Swarm that begin to fly around when approached, summoning reinforcements and damaging players. Genuinely, these locks are just a nuisance to hit, and the event is rather infuriating, especially with how quickly the undead overrun you. Once all three locks are destroyed, players are rewarded with an upgraded armor drops that can grant the player level 2 and 3 armor without having to pay for it, and Ethereum Chalices, which instantly upgrade the player's weapon depending on the rarity of the chalice. In addition, if player's health falls to 50 at any point during the current world, Peter will rescue players, stunning any nearby enemy and killing them. They will tremble before us. This was only a matter of time. As much as I feel the event plays terribly, the rewards are easily the best out of this whole set. Then there's the Omega Supply Helicopter. While this event does show up on the map, it doesn't count towards one of the map's three side objectives, so it's going to go in its own category. Weaver has tasked the strike team with committing murder and killing Omega soldiers attempting to escape with supplies. I'm fairly sure there's a rule in the Geneva Conventions about this, but you know, that little book that tells you not to commit war crimes? Regardless, the helicopter will begin to fly away as soon as players approach it, forcing them to shoot it down. If you have a shotgun, don't even bother. Once destroyed, the helicopter will release a supply crate and the corpses of those we've killed. Never forget, those are people too. Inside the crate is 250 high-grade salvage and 1500 common salvage. The next events are the ones that can only be found on the minimap when players are close enough to said event. The Ethereal Orb is an orb of Ethereum that players must chase around the map, shooting it whenever it stops. Doing this three times will reward players much like a golden chest. Unknown Signal has players coming across a radio. To increase the frequency of said radio, players must locate three amplifiers nearby and set them to the frequency of the main radio. The amplifiers will randomly let out a ringing noise that attracts the undead. Once all three of them are aligned, players will be granted 800 points and a random song to be added to their in-game music playlist. And finally, there's the Demented Echo event. Around each Outbreak map, after round 2, players can find an entity known as the Demented Echo. As stated by Peter, Demented Echoes are lost souls who have found a way back to the other side. Sadly, their bodies have been deformed and their minds destroyed. Some manage to escape, but the crossing between worlds is dangerous. They arrive home disfigured, changed into fiery demons, horrors devoid of humanity. If players encounter a Demented Echo, they will have a short time to dispatch of it. If the Demented Echo reaches the player, they will summon an ambush of the undead. And those are all the objectives that players can find in Outbreak, besides just killing the undead as they see them. While I really enjoyed the variety and creativity of each of these objectives and events, the mode is utterly destroyed by one single aspect, flow. As a solo player, my opinion on this is skewed, so bear with me. In solo, and even in co-op, these maps are just too big, and in an attempt to give players a unique and brand new experience, Outbreak's flow comes off as sluggish at best and, at its worst, mind-numbing. 
I'd say the mode suffers the most from its size and lifelessness. Outbreak is filled with a ton of open space, and if you ask me, the multiplayer maps used should have just been shrunk. I genuinely feel like there's already more than enough content to satisfy players with each map's primary locations. The map Zoo is oftentimes touted as the best Outbreak map because of the map's relatively smaller size and most of its major locales and events taking place closer to the center of the map, whereas maps like Alpine force players to travel to the ends of the earth to complete objectives and find specific machines like Pack-a-Punch and the Wonderfizz. Now, some people might defend this by saying, well, in a co-op mode, you're able to cover more ground, which is actually true, but I feel like objectives like the Dragon Relic, the Black Chest, the Fury Crystal, the Distress Call, and the main objective are considerably easier, and in the case of the Dragon Relic, is the best way to obtain the best reward if you have a coordinated team with you at all times. And events like the Fury Crystal almost depend on the full team being close by as more crystals are added depending on how many players are in the game. This causes the game's flow to run into the exact same issues that then plague solo games. For example, what if a player simply wanted to rush the main objective and proceed to the next world? To do this as quickly as possible, players spawn in, have to run all the way across the map to activate the main objective, complete said main objective, which can take anywhere from two to four minutes depending on the objective, and then run back across the map once again to activate the beacon. It doesn't seem like a long time, but it adds up quickly, with over 40% of the period being taken up by just simply nothing. And that's one of the fundamental issues with Outbreak's gameplay. It's nothing. Let me explain. While traversing the map, players will find the undead and Outbreak have a different level of AI. In normal round-based, zombies will always approach the player no matter where they are on the map. But on Outbreak, players will find the undead in a trance-like state, only awaken if players enter their proximity. Around 40% of your Outbreak experience will be filled with these encounters, sometimes varying with a mix of Hellhounds, Plaguehounds, and the occasional special and elite enemy. But because of the two-thirds point reduction per zombie, there's almost no reason to fight these pockets of the undead. Because of the value of objectives, players are incentivized to rush them as quickly as possible. I can't exactly put my finger on it, but it feels like a lack of true engagement and incentive if that makes sense. In normal round base, players upgrade their equipment and collect points by killing the undead. But in Outbreak, the undead are no longer the point-earning incentive. So then it just becomes that players are blindsided towards objectives. And granted, this is more of a me problem with the mode. I know a ton of people have fun just messing around and killing the undead in this large open world sandbox. And I'm glad you do. These are more just my issues with the mode. But these pockets of gameplay feel like a band-aid for an issue that's caused by the map's large size. I'm not saying Treyarch should have spent their time and resources shrinking each map, as that would take just as much time and effort to alter them as it would giving each map a zombie's coat of paint. Then there's the annoyance factor. If a player activates a small horde of the undead and attempts to run away from them, they'll be followed to the ends of the earth. And in the early rounds, there's not much of an issue with that. But past World 5, when enemies begin to super sprint, they'll definitely be followed to the ends of the earth. And for a mode like Outbreak, it begins to feel like busy work while trying to scavenge. My thoughts are contradictory. You have a mode that feels like it's devoid of engagement, but if the undead aren't dealt with, it feels like a chore to explore the map and scavenge. This issue is exacerbated when the player inevitably encounters a pack of hellhounds and plaguehounds. Just like the zombies, these undead dogs will follow players to the ends of the earth. And in the case of the plaguehounds, once a player stops to loot, they'll be attacked by plague gas and the 5-7 to seven zombies in an area. Honestly, it's just exhausting. But let's say you're looking for that endgame experience that takes you into the high rounds. What should a player be expecting? Well, as rounds climb higher, special enemies like the Mangler and elite enemies like the Megaton become much more common, especially during the main objective. Towards the end of the game of mine, the main objective, Secure, had three Krasny Soldats and two of the Forsaken's Abominations. The special enemy spam just becomes completely ridiculous in the high rounds, and it's almost laughable how the team expects players to handle all of this. And if you ask me, it's just sensory overload. Even with the best gear, equipment, and max perks, it's a challenge. But not a challenge in a fun way, it feels more like a challenge in the how many ranged enemies can we throw at players before it all becomes too overwhelming. My issue with it all is that the lack of balance between enemies. Because Treyarch wanted to include every enemy imaginable into Outbreak, you've got the standard zombie, the armored and heavy zombie, hellhounds and plaguehounds, the megaton, and from him the megaton blaster and bomber, the ranged tempest, the armored and flamethrower wielding Krasny Soldat, Firebase Z's Barguas and Manglers, 
Marauder Toten's health stealing and zombie buffing disciple, and finally, Forsaken's Abomination, a health sponge lightning spewing behemoth. It's all simply too much to handle, and the difficulty is absurd because of how all these enemies bounce off of one another with an extreme lack of cohesion tying them all together. The Abomination and the Disciple feel like they belong in another game, and the Megaton splitting becomes aggravating when you have 13 other special enemies to deal with. In Enemy Balance would have done this game mode wonders, like how in World War II Zombies, whistlings are capped out at 2 per round in solo, to prevent 50 of them from being on the field at a single time. And with all that talked about, let's go over the main quest. Both of them, in fact. As the DLC season went on, Outbreak was given more special enemies, events, objectives, and two whole easter eggs. Operatia Inversia follows up on many different plot threads. Dr. William Peck has been transferred from Firebase Z to the Ural Mountains, where he creates reality inversion warheads using the power of the Tempest. These rockets can create an outbreak zone wherever they land. During her recovery at Requiem HQ, Samantha Maxis connects with the leaders of Requiem and develops a friendly bond with Dr. Gray. During her stay, Samantha is shown to have violent outbursts, causing her to be quarantined from others. Over time, she is gifted a dog from Weaver, who Samantha names Not So, a play on the phrase Not So Fluffy. She eventually obtains a radio frequency from Gray and communicates with Ravanov. During the Easter egg, players connect to Samantha's frequency and with her help find projector slides that point players towards the Ruka Miso Silo, where the warheads are being kept. For a long time, we didn't know what it was, if it was even real. But Ravanov, he told me he found it. This must be it. The missile silo in Ruka. Once they arrive at the silo, the team meets up with Ravanov for a little IGC. Requiem! <clears throat> Somehow, Beck found a way to supercharge the crystal's power for his warheads. <clears throat> By using those crystalline creatures. Ravanov explains to the group that they must prevent these rockets from launching. If launched at the US, they'll be able to create an outbreak zone wherever they'd like. Now that's something I really want to see. Like, reimagining a fight with 80s politicians? Gold. Regardless, the team must traverse the site to collect three missile keys, the first being found in the middle of the silo. Inside are an insane amount of Bargwa spawns, and an event like this is just hilarious because of the absurd number of this enemy the game can load at once. Inside the Missile Silo C tunnel, players will find a collapsed body. Interacting with it will cause an HVT Bargwa to attack players. Once defeated, he'll drop the first key. The second key belongs to an ethereal jellyfish. After collecting 20 ethereal shards and fusing them all together inside an ethereum canister, players can activate an ethereum blast to enter the jellyfish and trade the canister for the second key. How we don't die is beyond me. The third key can be found taken by an ethereal monkey. To confiscate the key, Players must grab an essence trap that has a banana taped to it. Because as Ravanov would say, Another lava banana. Trapping the monkey will net players the third key. Now players must approach each launch bay and activate the key order based on the colored dots above the key insertion point. Once the rockets are activated, players are asked to return above ground and figure out how to remove the ethereum crystals blocking the hatches, as a swarm of tempests begin to fuse together to form an entity known as Legion. Have you ever seen the likes of these? No. This is different. Those tempests. What are they doing? The mother of God. Did you know they could do that? Amazing. Honestly, I just want to give props to how this scene is set. With the clock against them, players must avoid the undead onslaught and defeat Legion before the rockets implode inside of the hatches, and invert half of Russia. Legion sports a large variety of attacks. He can create an ethereum vortex that covers a fourth of the arena and will drain players' health if they enter it. 
bombard the sky with small crystals that damage players if they hit them, and launch a giant blast of electricity that can instantly down players if they're not careful. Once players have destroyed Legion's armor, the enemy's weak point will be revealed. Players must shoot one of Legion's three orbs to deal damage. Once destroyed, a third of the fight will be finished. Destroying all three orbs nets players the win, and a really cool death animation. And also, this reaction from one of my mods, who spent a year trying to complete this egg. Oh, we actually um, yes! that Aaron really. He's on it. Damn, Aaron really cheering. <laughs> GG, boys. Oh. You wanna know yeah, why we did that? I carried Aaron, are you team. okay? Finally! <laughs> oh my god. Finally! <laughs> <laughs> One of the worst parts about the fight is a special enemy spam. Much like a standard game of Outbreak, players have to deal with Krasnys, Megatons, Barguas, and Manglers all at the same time. It's very overwhelming, and because of the lack of an armor refill station, players' armor will be quickly picked away, making a down more or less the end of the game, regardless of a revive. The outro cutscene has players successfully launching the rockets into the Pacific Ocean, and Raptor 1 swoops in to take the team home, to be court-martialed by the government. And they all lived happily ever after. Operatia Inversia is a mess. From Super Sprinters originally also spawning in the silos, to a boss fight that also had way too much health, to special enemy spam, and most of the egg only taking place in the last 30 minutes. But despite all these flaws, I really enjoyed this questline. Events like the Bargwa Rush and the boss fight are a lot of fun, and victory in Cold War has never felt sweeter. The only issue I have is how long it takes to get back to the boss fight. If you plan on getting completely set up and have a perfect game, it can take anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours because of Outbreak's base DNA, which is a very lengthy and drawn out process to get yourself set up. But much like the Eye of Odin and Mephistopheles, victory is what makes it all worth it. So that's the first Outbreak Easter Egg, but what about the second one? Following the events of Operatia and Versia, the Strike Team were almost court-martialed, Samantha has been locked up by the Director, and Ravanov is deemed an enemy of the state. As these current tensions die down, Ravanov contacts Weaver, requesting him to aid other Soviet defectors like himself. Once again, Weaver sends in the Strike Team for Operation Excision. Throughout the map, players can find ethereal tears that teleport them high into the sky, and typically grant them a power-up. But on the third world, players can find a red ethereal tear. Traveling inside will take players on a little flying adventure, as they traverse various red portals hidden in the sky. After the fourth portal, a beacon device can be found that connects the team to Ravanov to exfil the defectors. Arriving at Sanatorium, players approach the crashed helicopter, and listen to a radio from Hugo Jaeger, the leader of the Soviet defectors. He explains to the team how to reach them by using a device called the Ethereum Neutralizer, a device which can aid survivors in bypassing the phase that surrounds every outbreak map. By collecting a red orb and Mr. Peaks, the bunny rabbit from the box, players are able to power the device and actually travel outside a sanatorium where they can see some really cool events. For example, you can find a group of Legion honoring a crystal. Or should I say, pondering the orb? Yeah, the script was written a while ago. Once at the site, players will find a beautiful landscape, which would make for a really good set piece. It's a shame you don't get to do a whole lot here. Once you've made your way to the top of the site, you learn Dr. Jaeger was a mole designed to kill the defectors and lure the strike team into a trap. Soon we will change the world, Requiem. Auf Wiedersehen. Get the hell out of there! It's a goddamn trap! <laughs> Raptor 1, my team's about to be overrun! I need an exfil, now! Our copy, Weaver. Hunker down, team up. And with that, the egg's boss fight begins. Weaver commands the team to escape as an Orda appears from beneath the earth. You know, they never quite explain how Karchenko was able to convince this creature to do this. Regardless, this fight is a standard Exfil adventure, with an Orda thrown into the mix. There's not much to say besides don't die and achieve victory. Once defeated, the team prematurely celebrates their victory, before being shot down by Omega and captured by Kravchenko as the game's narrative shifts into its next big experience. 
Operation Excision serves more of a narrative purpose than a gameplay one, and I feel that hurts the quest more than you'd think it would. But sometimes you gotta crack a few eggs to make an omelet. Now, does this excuse the fight? No. But I understand it, and it feels like it sets up the dynamic of the next map really well. And that's Outbreak, an absolutely ambitious project that throws so many new ideas and mechanics at the wall to see what sticks. If you ask me, the mode does a lot of ideas really well, but it isn't able to cohesively stitch them all together eloquently. Personally, Outbreak is a flawed game mode at a design level. The team clearly wanted to use the fire team in combined arms maps and find a way to make them fit into zombies. But I feel the overall execution is quite weak because of the baseline issues that would cause the team to entirely rework these maps to make them a perfect fit for the game mode. It's why I'm giving it such a low rating. At its core, Outbreak has some clever ideas, and while not a broken mode by any means like, say, Tortured Path, it's a mode bogged down by its own issues and its DNA that needed to be reworked. Although I know I'm in the minority with this statement, Outbreak clearly found a dedicated audience with casual players. And at the end of the day, if the mode has found so much success in these places, well then it has to be doing something, right? Oh my gosh, guys! How could I forget about the best feature of all? Fishing! Cast out your line and listen to some sweet tunes as you fish for salvage, armor, and other rarities! 5 out of 10? I meant to say 10 out of 10! Outbreak is clearly the Final Fantasy XV VR fishing game of Call of Duty Zombies! Even now, when someone tells me there's a Final Fantasy XV VR fishing game, I go, what hell yeah, what? Overall, Outbreak is a high-concept project that feels like the next step towards the future of the game mode. Although, some tweaking will do the idea wonders. Duran Fong is not the right direction, of course. So with all that said, let's make our way as a prisoner of war to arguably the game's best map, Mauer der Toten. You son of a fucking bitch. To me now. Fine, Valentina. Stop here, army. You will do this, or your Raptor pilot dies. Mariner Toten is the fourth map in our Cold War zombie storyline. Following the events of Outbreak's Operation Excision, Mauer der Toten takes players into the heart of Berlin. Alexandria Valentina from Firebase Z opens a dark ether breach, consuming a portion of the city in an outbreak zone to accomplish her own nefarious goals. Now with the intent to stop her, Kravchenko tasks the strike team with putting an end to her terror or die trying. Mauer der Toten takes the stakes, characters, and plot lines from the year's previous adventures and puts them all together to create an engaging narrative with an actual threat that must be stopped. Unlike the previous three experiences, in place of our Requiem operators, Mauriter Toten puts players under the command of Kravchenko, his right-hand man Gorev, Jaeger from Operation Excision, and Dr. William Peck, everyone's favorite dancing goober. The team-up between the two groups is honestly one of the story's more interesting narrative twist. Because of the unique way Craig Houston and his team had written the storyline of Cold War, they were able to make this event a reality. Now, before we move on, I have to point this out. Why does Jaeger's face look so uncanny? It's like he's not even human, like a fish with human eyes. Now, let's talk about the map's aesthetic and level design. Mauriter Toten is built atop the campaign level Hole in the Wall and the multiplayer level Yubon. So what does Mauer do that makes it stand out, despite the fact that it shares its level design and DNA with other parts of the game? Well, for starters, the map uses zip lines to great effect. First showing up in Call of the Dead and Tog Toten, Mauer der Toten features two-way zip lines that stitch together many of the map's various set pieces, taking Diarize's idea of a building-to-building -building map concept and executing it perfectly. As simple as it sounds, it adds a whole new dimension to the vertical-based gameplay Treyarch has been trying to implement for a very long time. This addition takes a bloated and cumbersome map concept like Voyage of Despair and turns it into a high-stakes and fast-paced adventure. It is easily one of the map's greatest strengths, and something you might not have thought about how much of a game changer it is. Then there's the map's atmosphere and setup process. At first, the city starts out extremely dark, with the shine of your flashlight and the various emergency flares leading the way. The only set piece players can make out is the ritual circle in the middle of the city. It truly feels like the area is being held hostage by an otherworldly threat. As players traverse the underground passage to power, they'll find runaway trains with screaming passengers and the sounds of the damned. Set pieces like this are how you set the tone of a map. Mauer truly feels nothing like the maps its DNA takes from. I 
hope you are smart enough to avoid being hit by a train. <laughs> Once the power is turned on, the map's true colors show. The area redefines the mood of the city, with bright sterilized lighting, a rainy storm, and the purple waves of an outbreak zone surrounding the city. The mood feels like what Advanced Warfare's outbreak was trying to accomplish. The two maps are more similar than you might think. A desolate, rainy facility with sterilized lighting shining from all angles, as if you're some kind of lab rat. Mauer uses the delicate state of the city to make players feel like they're at the center of an epidemic. There are numerous camps stationed around the town, and despite all of the aid the area has seen, none of it has come close to rescuing those affected, and slow down the spread that remains. While this is all just set dressing, it's amazing the mood the team at Treyarch was able to establish, without saying a word. And it's why the map ranks so high for me personally. This isn't just some ruined city. Much like Garag Krovi before it, Mauer is THE ruined city, one being assaulted by the forces outside of their control. Then there's the gameplay. Mauer der Toten takes players throughout the city of Berlin, avoiding trains, mechanized beasts, and disciples of the One Forsaken. The enemy roster takes from maps previous, while inventing some new ones along the way. The first enemy encountered are the Tempest from Outbreak, found stealing power fuses. While only spawnable under certain conditions, the enemy cameos in the map's early moments and an easter egg. The next enemy player's encounter is the Disciple, a being of a more mystical energy, the Disciple can imbue the undead with increased health and movement speed. Consider them the Nova Bombers of Cold War, but unlike Nova Bombers and the notorious Water Catalyst, any imbued zombie will lose its enhanced status if the Disciple is defeated, giving players more of an incentive to prioritize the enemy, but the Disciple doesn't punish them if they fail to do so either. The Disciple can also drain the life out of the player, which can only be interrupted if the player shoots the Disciple's face mask off. This enemy is a really cool addition to the game. I love its animations and modeling work. The way it patrols the battlefield by flying over obstacles is a really cool visual. On round 10, players see the return of Outbreak's Krasny Soldat. What it's doing here is unclear. Looking for batteries? I don't know. Towards the mid-10s, players will encounter the Tormentor, a dog-like enemy that will rush up to player's current position and explode on them if they aren't quickly dispatched. Once defeated, these enemies will leave behind an explosion that can damage players regardless. These enemies are completely negated if you're wearing armor. And finally, on round 25, the Russian Mangler will be added to the enemy pool. Much like how Firebase Z's Hellhounds make a late game appearance too. I'm somewhat torn on this decision making. While I think it's really cool enemies are continually added to the map's roster as the game goes on, I also believe it cheapens an enemy's uniqueness. For example, the Mangler was originally an enemy only found on Garag Krovi. But following its introduction in Cold War, the Mangler shows up in Garag Krovi, Firebase E, Outbreak, Mountain Toten, Forsaken, and every single Onslaught map. The enemy becomes stale when overused constantly. This same issue applies to the Panzer Soldat and its variants. At the very least, the Panzer has always changed up its weaponry and interaction with the player. The Russian Mangler is near identical to its Garag Krovi variation. From enemies, let's talk about our newest ally, Klaus. Created by Dr. Gray, Klaus is a silver protector-like robot that has developed a consciousness. Somehow. Following a leak regarding an operation titled Project Janus, the director of Requiem sent Klaus to Berlin to eliminate the Requiem soldiers who had heard of the report. Now placed in a CIA safe house, players have to locate his hands and a battery to reactivate him for field use. Klaus uses an XM4 and punches those close to him while in combat. Funny enough, just like the Civil Protector who sported the KN-44, the XM4 is considered Cold War's default assault rifle. In the early rounds, Klaus is quite effective at his job, and he dispatches enemies with ease, and aids the player by reviving teammates in a pinch. Klaus can also be repositioned by using the remote given to players when activated. Thankfully, the remote stashes away the player's tactical grenade slot for the time being, not forcing players to decide between their equipment and a map feature. A simple addition, but a nice one for sure. Klaus can also be upgraded three separate times, giving him an upgraded XM4 with each upgrade and a new outfit for upgrade levels 2 and 3, with only the first upgrade level needed to complete the egg. As a quick aside, I just love the way the mustache on Klaus is drawn. Why does he look like that? And something that is also never explained is why he sounds like he has a German accent. It has nothing to have it there, but it does make him sound funnier. Also, some of his quotes are nice tongue-in-cheek references to past experiences and theories. I feel depressed. None of you know how that feels. You are a little too eager. Do you believe there may be life on Mars? Wrong. Shoes do not have souls. Or do they? If I had a bedroom, I would go sit in it. 
alone. In case you do not know, there is a reason why hot dogs and buns come packed in different numbers. It is like comparing apples and oranges, bananas. Do you ever wonder why you are here? Question your role in the universe. My advice is, don't be a robot. The other really cool addition to the map is its wonder weapon. The conversion ready binary repeater standard, otherwise known as the Cerberus. Easily one of my favorite wonder weapons in the series that built upon the template for other wonder weapons like the Kraken. The Cerberus is a chrome fitted laser pistol that supports voice mods for one of the three Requiem leaders. So with each game, players might hear a different voice. This is the closest the community got to playable in-map characters, with the weapon producing quotes similar to how a specific Requiem leader would actually react if they were in the situation. How about that? Fresh fingers for my trigger. The name's Cerberus. Let's not stand on ceremony and get to work. <sighs> there is a sharpshooter in all of us, soldiers. Cheers! I don't work well on an empty stomach. Why these three and Weaver still weren't the main characters in this game continues to blow my mind. The Cerberus standard fires high damage laser shots that are doubled by a secondary orb that produces additional shots at no extra cost, giving the weapon double damage. When fully packed, a standard body shot does around 8,000 damage, on par with the ray gun. This factor alone puts the weapon above the rest, and with a well-placed headshot, this weapon can two-hit nearly any standard zombie at any round. Add ring of fire on top of that, and you're practically invincible under any standard situation. Then there's the weapon's upgrade variants. As stated by the team themselves, the Cerberus upgrade method takes inspiration from arcade-like shoot-'em-ups like Galaga and Contra. I'm really excited about this one as it takes me back to my days in the arcades playing shoot-'em-ups where you, you know, get power-ups for your ship and change the way your weapon functions. Picking up one of the three mod kits will transform the weapon into a different variant. The Cerberus Blazer fires a concentrated beam of energy, similar to the die cryo emitter, in more ways than one. The Cerberus Diffuser fires a shotgun spread of bullets that can deal high damage to enemies at a close range. A really close range. Then there's the Cerberus Swarm. Firing a barrage of rockets, the Swarm will take down up to eight enemies at a time with each volley. At least it should. Each variant of the Cerberus comes with their own ammo supply, and can be switched out interchangeably. Once a variant has run out of ammo, the Cerberus will revert back to its base variant. While taking a similar upgrade approach to the Kraken, the Cerberus being able to be upgraded on the fly is a great way to keep the flow of the game going, without having to needlessly travel to the ends of the map to change out the weapon's elemental variant. Like, what if the Kraken came with the distiller pre-installed? The weapon would be an immediate fan favorite. But who am I getting? This isn't a Voyage of Despair review. But, just like the die's elemental variants, the Cerberus's mod kit variants are consistently missing that push to make them effective. The Blazer needs more pierce and damage. This thing should be shredding through hordes by the numbers like the flamethrower. The Diffuser should be a boss crusher that eliminates special enemies in a single hit, much like the Scorched Tree Can Cannon, but with a faster firing speed. And the Swarm should just be a reinvented war machine. Oh my goodness, I'm just reinventing killstreaks again. But above all else, each variant is just missing damage. I feel like the Cerberus's variants would fit the arcade aesthetic really well if they came with less ammo, but insta-killed any horde effortlessly. Let's take DeadOps Arcade for example. Players can pick up alternate weapons like the Death Machine that decimate the horde, but last for a short time, forcing players to consider the best way to get the use out of each of these weapons. The base Cerberus should function exactly like that, slightly underpowered, with the mod kit filling in the, for the role of the actual wonder weapon it would incentivize players to use the mod kits. Now, granted, most people don't care about efficiency or high rounds, and they'll use the variants regardless, which is a fair point. Cold War has pulled in a much broader audience, and a more casual-friendly one at that. So why do I bring up this stuff from a hardcore player's perspective? I don't know, these are my thoughts, and I believe it would actually help make the mod kits stand out more, because at this point, it's either the standard variant or nothing. And then there's the map's music selection. Besides the Easter egg song being Amoeba by the band Adolescence, Mauro de Toten features a ton of great tracks, as it manages to hit the right blend between the map's two themes, grunge and sci-fi. With tracks like Berlin 1985, What Awaits, The Round Change Stingers, and the map's Game Over theme belonging to grunge,
in tracks like Avogadro from Alpha Omega, used during the Pack-a-Punch sequence, Acid Bunny, and Wrath, all fitting the sci-fi theme. The reason I bring up the mass music selection, unlike Firebase C, is because the tracks manage to elevate the experience in Mauro Toten, while driving home the mass primary themes and pairing really well with the visuals. The reason Kevin and his music team were unable to work on a dedicated Easter egg song for the map is because the team was hard at work developing the game's OST, with each of Mauro's themes being no exception. One of my absolute favorites being Wrath, written by Brian Tui. If you don't know who he is, he's the guy who wrote this, 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 and above all, this. If you ask me, this man is just as talented as Kevin Sherwood, and deserves just as much love. Like, let's talk about him and his team's work on Acid Money, a track that plays when players collect the various pieces of Mr. Peaks around the map. Collecting the sixth piece will teleport players into a nightclub, where they must fight off hordes of the undead, with the beat of the track matching the gameplay, and when players can fight the enemy. Enemies that make an appearance in this event are the Disciples, the Manglers, the Barguas, and even a guest appearance by the Megaton. Completing this side easter egg rewards players with a chance to receive a reward behind one of the three various doors. Don't worry, you'll always pick the wrong one. There's even a calling card for picking the right door, which doesn't matter because even if you get the best reward, you don't get the card if the game doesn't give you the Cerberus from the chest. Hey, fun fact, I'm only bringing up all this so I can talk about the fact that the ending of the side quest uses an instrumental version of Right Where We Belong as the background music. And if there's an opportunity for me to bring up Voyage of Despair, I'll do it. Then there's all the map's little oddities I forgot to bring up in my script. Like the Mule Kick perk machine being able to actually kill the undead if players purchase it with any undead nearby. No Man's Land in the middle of the map has one-time dig sites. Why this isn't a continued feature on the map will forever blow my mind. And the watchtowers act as turrets that kill both players and the undead. A trap can be activated that makes them more functional against the horde, like Mob Sniper Tower. Fun fact, this is the game's first of only two traps. It's weird how absent they are in Cold War, but that's most likely because you're already as broken as you are. Traps are superfluous in this game, and the turret trap is a perfect example of this. I completely forgot it even existed. And finally, there's the burning trains that run through the tracks in the subway. And yes, I've been hit by the train. No, I will not elaborate on this feature further. Alright, let's talk about the map's main quest. Alexandria Valentina, otherwise known as Angelica Hannibal Vogel, is the daughter of the director of Project End Station, Ulrich Vogel. During the waning years of World War II, Germany assigned the team of Project End Station one final assignment, Operation Balder. Ulrich Vogel and an army of Nazis were tasked with staying in the Dark Aether, in the hopes that they could one day be called upon to retake Germany should the country fall to the Allied forces. What the Germans were unprepared for was to lose their minds and their lives to the Dark Aether and the one and only Forsaken. As a kid, Valentina was visited in her dreams by the Forsaken, posing as her father, and made it her life goal to finish his work and complete Operation Balder, bringing the Germans home and allowing them to retake Germany. Valentina is also the one who revealed the existence of End Station to Kravchenko when he first arrived at Omega. She continued to make trips to End Station's secret Berlin lab, and finally opened an ethereal tear, creating an outbreak zone in Berlin. Entering the Dark Aether, Valentina submitted to the Forsaken and became a general in his army. 
Kravchenko, wanting to stop this, sends in the Requiem Strike Team to put an end to her. Players begin the quest by reactivating Klaus and finding the entrance to the lab in the subway, with Klaus's quotes pushing players in the right direction. I think I might be remembering something. There is something hidden nearby. Is there a reason you cannot do it yourself? After punching the wall and opening the doorway with the Blazer Cerberus, players find and station Berlin Lab. Nicole and a janitor? This place looks clean! Once inside, Valentina reveals herself over the intercom, and after a quick tormentor round, players are tasked with building an inversion warhead to close the breach and stop the Forsaken. Fun fact, the inversion warheads made by Peck during Operatia Inversia were supposed to stop the Forsaken and not attack America. Fun little mid-season twist. But who knows, Krychenko could also be lying through his teeth. If the Forsaken were to get into our world, it would destroy us. My inversion warheads were meant to stop it. You didn't know, did you? What did you think they were for? To destroy the West? You were operating on bad intelligence, I'm afraid. The truth is, you destroyed the only safeguard we had. Players assemble the bomb by locating Ethereum canisters and filling them with Tempest Essence, using a Tempest lore module found nearby. Delivering the three canisters powers the inversion warhead. Now to find the nuke responsible for the device, players have to upgrade Klaus to the first level and use his abilities to stop a train. You are weak and pathetic. So a little tidbit about this easter egg. This is the first main quest my friends and I ever completed without a guide, and on day one. When we got to this step, it took us quite a while to figure out what to do. We knew there was a non-flaming train that would run by whenever you switched the tracks. And at the CIA tents around the map, you can find posters and blueprints hinting players towards the right direction. Answers aren't exactly given away, but there's just enough information to piece everything together with a little bit of ingenuity. And trust me, it's a lot better than this, or this, or this. Once the train has been stopped, players can enter it and find a Requiem keycard used to access the servers and the nuke. Now all that's missing is the uranium to power it. Creating a hacking helmet for Klaus, players can access Requiem's server and utilize the laser beam from both Firebase Z and Outbreak to pull a Megaton HVT out of the Dark Aether. Defeating them will net players two radioactive pieces of uranium they must cleanse before they melt down, ENDING THE GAME! Yeah, the stakes just got a little bit higher. Using the zipline and rocket propellers, players can smash the two pieces of uranium together, cleansing them. Doing this twice will complete the step, forcing Valentina to appear and put a stop to us before we can complete the warhead. With the Forsaken and his army fast approaching, the team is tasked with defeating Valentina, in honestly one of the game's best boss fights next to Legion. Like, look at how the team sets the scene when she approaches. <laughs> I already told you, you are too late. We are here. My god, Valencina, is that you? What have you become? My name is Angelica Hanford, daughter of Ulrich Vogel. I am here. To complete his mission, the dawn of the new Reich begins now! Valentina comes with a protective shield that must be destroyed before players can attack her, and a variety of attacks. She can summon a wave of fury crystals that decimate a player's armor, turn the skies red and summon a horde of tormentors, summon undead minions to drain their life and recover her own, and past phase one, she'll gain a screen nuke attack that instantly kills any players not behind cover. Alongside her are the Krasny Soldats and the Disciples, making the fight very chaotic very quickly. Sporting a large health pool and means of recovery, Valentine's fight could go on for quite a while, making it all the more entertaining and well designed. Unlike fights like Orda or the Elephants that can be dispatched as quickly as the strongest weapon allows, Valentina's flow has a really good back and forth between the player, and it feels legitimately satisfying to fight her. It's kind of like Mephistopheles. Players are able to gauge their progress, and the fight covers five different phases, giving it a good sense of progression. Although, it could be shortened to three or four phases, and simply extend the health bar per phase, as there's a bit more running around than I'd like. The fifth phase takes players back to the lab, 
Defeating Valentina will have the team hooking her up to a device and draining her life force to complete the warhead. With one final objective, Klaus grabs the device and heads towards the portal, needing to be protected so he can complete his mission. The track used here is amazing and perfectly matches the map's two themes. With just moments to spare, the Forsaken taunts the team before Klaus enters the Dark Aether and activates the device, completing the mission and temporarily stopping this demonic force. I'll be the same. Promise freedom, the team returns above ground, where Karchenko attempts to gun them down, no longer seeing a use for the strike team. Over the comms, Samantha urges players to get to the roof before helping them escape through a portal she created. With the strike team saved, Klaus gone, Valentina defeated, and the Forsaken halted, the director of Requiem bides its time, knowing Samantha is the final obstacle in his plan. Project Q, Janus. See, it's funny because it, you, you get it because it sounds like huge. Janus. Mauer's Easter request is easily the best of Cold Wars from its fun and engaging steps to some exciting set pieces and moments. Steps are dictated by player skill and not their ability to complete a puzzle. And the boss fight is a lot of fun. It's difficult, but not impossible. It has a good progression and it actually feels like the difficulty caps at the boss fight. It's easy with the right setup, but for most first time players, I know they'll get a proper fight out of it. And finally, how does the map actually play? From spawn to power, players can get the map open relatively quickly. The trains are a great set piece, but so rarely used and are hardly a threat. The back a bunch scene is a lot of fun, and picking the Avogadro track for the moment worked really well. The dig sites offer players an early salvage bonus, and by round 8, players have the entire map open, and wide training spots make the map very casual friendly. Players can easily route Krasny Solets and Disciples because of this. The Cerberus destroys the map's balance, which is a good thing, and makes high rounds extremely quick. More camping spots open up to players, and the zip lines are one of the best movement innovations yet. Once you reach round 10 and collect the pieces to start up the Klaus, the map's Easter egg flows really well, and the steps are started and completed with vigor. Players can have the map completed in about as short as 50 minutes, and many of the map's areas feel important and well laid out. In conclusion, Mauer de Toten is one of Cold War's best maps. From its solid level design and atmosphere, to its great soundtrack and Easter egg, Mauder Toten leaves players wanting more, which is a shame. The map is this close to becoming one of the series' greatest, and with a bit more time and resources, might have been one for the ages like a Go Ride Krovi 2. Sadly, the map was held back by time constraints put on the team. But for what it's worth, I still fell in love with Mauer. Believing the team truly knocked it out of the park, it's a map I'll always be returning to, especially with its fun cast of characters. Kravchenko and Peck make for a surprisingly good pair, and their dialogue of bouncing off each other works really well. It's clear the map was being developed around the time the game was released, and many of the larger criticisms that the community had given the game, like the lack of playable characters, had been retroactively worked on through avenues like the Cerberus and Klaus. It's not a complete fix, but to say the developers weren't listening to feedback would be a lie. As chronicled by Junior Rizzo, many features like a lack of salvage in the mid-game, a slow early game, and the health cap changes were all answered and changed, with features like the milestone salvage every 5 rounds past 10, the rampage inducer, the rampage inducer being updated to last till round 55, and the health cap being increased from 30,000 to 120,000, and then back to 60,000 per player feedback. I'm bringing this up at the end of the Mauer review, because it's quite obvious community feedback had a huge impact on the game as a whole, and this map shows it off more than any other. Good feedback can go a long way, like in this game's case. So with all that said, let's escape Berlin and make our way to Cold War's final map. Does the team manage to finish strong, or slip up just short of the finish line? Well, let's find out. Today, the downfall of Omega begins. 
Forsaken is the grand finale in our Cold War Zombies adventure. This map takes all the pieces and storylines created throughout the year and throws them all together in one final hurrah. If you were following along with the intel, a lot of plot threads were paid off, and the end of the first chapter of the Dark Aether saga was completed. But due to time constraints, I believe the map ends up being the weakest of the bunch. So what does the team manage to scramble together? Let's find out. Arriving at the Zakara ba Patska. Arriving at the Zakara Patska Oblast. Arriving at this place, Requiem infiltrates this decommissioned Ukrainian base in an attempt to stop Omega from rescuing Kazmir Zykov, a man who would lead the team to capturing the all-powerful Forsaken. Arriving through a portal created by Samantha Maxis, the strike team heads in to end things once and for all. Forsaken storytelling is easily one of the map's greatest strengths. Sorry, not storytelling exactly, but more like its character interactions and players in the game. Forsaken features Weaver, one of the three Requiem operators, Ravanov, Krabchenko, Peck, Samantha Maxis, and the titular Forsaken. If you were following along with the story throughout the year, then Forsaken truly feels like a penultimate experience. At least it should. Just like Firebase C, it's nice to have a living, breathing cast. The only issue is we can't play or interact as any of them, like pawns in someone else's game. And like a double-edged sword, Forsaken's plot-driven narrative can take less involved players out of the experience. The map story is most rewarding to those who are invested in the characters. A very similar criticism levied at other story-heavy maps like Origins, Revelations, and Blood of the Dead. But to the writer's credit, players don't exactly need to know the ins and outs of the story to get the full experience. In a smart decision by the team, major plot elements like Valentina's reveal on Maurer, Samantha's quarantine in Operazia and Versia, and allusions to Zykov being the all-powerful Forsaken are all referenced and hinted at in Intel, for those who wanted to sink their teeth into the storyline, but also referred to in a mass-specific main quest, for those who seek to view the game's storyline from a casual point of view. Most major plot elements revealed in Intel are always brought up in maps, lessening the importance of said radios, allowing anyone of any skill level to get involved. If you are following along with the Intel, then you're more likely to root for Peck, excited when Samantha shows up with her new powers, or sad that Gorov and Jaeger have seemingly jumped ship. But if you don't have the time to catch up on sudden intel, the game's storytelling doesn't punish you for doing so, and just gives you the cliff notes, stating what's important and leaving out what's not. It's easily one of my favorite parts about the game's storytelling next to its more traditional approach taken throughout the season. People give the intel system a lot of criticism, but the game's story is not tethered to it as tightly as many claim. For example, in Black Ops 3, Peter McCain randomly shows up in Grow I Kroby's intro cutscene, if you are a casual viewer, you might not even know who this character is, much less why he's following through the sky with the premise crew. But if you were keeping up with the game's ciphers and external lore, you'll learn that in Derizendrock, Peter McCain is on a mission with the Raygun Mark III and falls through a dimensional rift. We never learn his motives and reasonings. The character is simply a cameo in the Garai Krovi intro for fans to gawk at. This is absolutely a moment of nostalgia in service of a character and learning the intel is the only explanation as to why this character is here in the first place, even if it hardly adds much to the actual storyline. I'm bringing all this up in the Forsaken review because the map is more than willing to give players a hand in the story department, and in my opinion it accomplishes exactly what it sets out to do in spades in terms of writing. But I can also understand the opinion that the story feels flat and disconnected. The operator system hurts the game's story more than I can put into words. Moving on, let's talk about another similarity the level shares with Revelations, the map's layout. Separated between five different zones, Forsaken has players teleporting in and out of areas, like isolated arenas. There's Spawn, Main Street, Anytown, the Bunker, and the Command Tower. Each of these areas is connected with teleporters. Once the map's lockdown is lifted, the Command Tower becomes a central hub that stitches together the map with many different zip lines and a portal that leads back to Spawn, completing the map's loop. This is easily the best approach the team could have taken with the map's preset campaign layout, and while it was likely efficient, it is more of a hindrance than they might have thought. Unlike Revelations, which features means of travel that takes players in an obvious direction, the layout of Forsaken's arenas has players teleporting all around the map space to reach the command tower. The overall product is clunky, and it makes it extremely difficult for players to position themselves in a pinch. The only way to truly know where you are in relation to the maps of their areas is to base your current position by the area you came from and the one you can travel to next. I get it, it's a confusing and weird analysis. But Forsaken's level design is sadly not as organic as the one that came before it. 
And while a fix is really hard to recommend, I believe the Revelations approach might have been the way to go. Spawn players in Main Street and have the jump pads and teleporters connecting players in a circular motion around the arena, with a command tower taking the same approach it already has. But then the map would just be too big. Just like Outbreak, a flaw in Forsaken's map design is all relative to its inherent DNA, one the developers didn't exactly account for. Now, granted, don't take this criticism as, the team should have just done better. For what it's worth, the developers did an amazing job given the circumstances thrusted upon them. This video is a critical and subjective look at that work. By all means, I want to reiterate, I do believe the team did a great job. If the terms were better, I know Treyarch would have knocked it out of the park. And seeing as their next game releases in 2024, and not 2023, I think that they'll be back on their feet in no time. But back to Forsaken. An overlooked feature from the map is its aesthetic approach. Fully embracing a sci-fi fantasy feel, Forsaken, like Maurer, comes into its own with its sound design, color palette, and set dressing. Some immediate examples are the skybox. Marking a resemblance to Origins, the vortex above is a great little set piece, even if it's reused from Outbreak. The vortex is utilized really well here, and honestly just makes for a great image when you're at spawn. I also love how the map is in immediate state of decay. Teleporters must be reactivated, and much of the staff manned to the base have turned or gone AWOL. It's simple set dressing, but having to repair these teleporters really goes to show how much of the facility was strung together. In a reflection of the actual USSR, a lot of Omega's resources and technologies begin to fail and fall short of success in the long run, as the system itself is not able to support itself, and Forsaken perfectly represents that, even if some of these effects were unintended and ironic like the campaign mission being reused as a base template. Then there's the soundtrack. Coming from the grounded red light green light, the zombies version needs little introduction to set the mood, fully embracing the sci-fi tone. Like just take a listen to some of the map's various tracks. The list is short, but extremely effective, with the track Samantha's Ballad being a Brian Toohey spin on the Samantha's Lullaby motif. And I love the map's color palette of blues and purples. Throughout the season, each map has taken a different approach to its color palette, with Deep Machina being a lot of whites, Firebase Z being a lot of oranges, Outbreak being really a myriad of colors, but I'm going to say green, Maurer Toten being red, and finally Forsaken being blue and purple. So it's really nice to get the full rainbow color palette throughout the year. Now I know my thoughts here are subjective, but personality and color definition are, in my opinion, some of the team's best work. Now, let's talk about the map's gameplay. Starting at round 1, players are reintroduced to the No Man's Land mechanic from Moon. Unlike that map, however, Forsaken uses the game's standard enemy formula as a base template, rather than an infinitely spawning horde of the undead separate from the game's normal round counter. Once 6 zombies are spawned in, the map moves on to round 2. Once another 8 are spawned in, the map moves on to round 3, and so on and so forth, forcing round progression as players eliminate the undead. This was a really smart move on the developer's part. With how overpowered players are in Cold War, the old No Man's Land mechanic would have had players entering the map on round 1 with easily 30,000 points. So this is a good compromise, and in my opinion, it really helps the map's flow. In as short as 5-10 to 10 minutes, players can quickly surpass the game's early rounds, pocket 20,000 points, and have the entire map open. The level's flow is one of the best in the series. At least that's what I think. Forsaken isn't bogged down by lengthy quests and side objectives, open the doors, repair some teleporters, and infiltrate the base. Simple as pie. Then there's the game's final new adversary, the Abomination. Like the Tempest in Krasny before it, the Abomination is the Dark Aether iteration of the Apothecant Margwa. 
Featuring a more mobile body structure resembling a lion, the Abomination rushes towards players with a mighty sprint, electrocutes them with lightning breath, performs light damage trying to bite down on players, and sports tough skin that nullifies most means of damage by upwards of 90%. At first appearing unstoppable, the Abomination's weak point lies in its ancestral DNA. While one of the beast's three mouths is glowing, players can fire at them to apply major damage. Exposed and damaged mouths can continue to be fired at, offering a lighter damage reduction, but being more lenient in allowing players to continually deal damage, unlike the Margwa's very back and forth, fencing-like gameplay style. And to combat an enemy as tough as this abomination, players can forge the Crystal Axe, a Dark Aether wonder weapon said to have been forged specifically to take down the Forsaken by a Dark Aether entity known as Paragamus. Fun fact, this entity was apparently the original ruler of the Disciples. Sporting two different firing modes, the Crystal Axe Savager is a destructive war axe that can fire a swirling vortex, and the Crystal Axe Storm is a fast-firing SMG that can create Ethereum explosions. Together, these two weapons will lead you and your team to victory. Which is what I would say if the Crystal Axe Savager wasn't completely busted. The weapon sports high damage and restores players' armor, which is all fine and dandy, until you remember that there's a melee player upgrade that heals players as they use melee abilities on the undead, creating an interesting situation where players are practically invincible until round 45, where the weapon basically has to two-shot most standard enemies. Not only does it have a fast swing, but like Ethereal Razor from Black Ops 4, can attack four to five foes at a time. So until round 45, it's almost comical how overpowered the Savager is compared to its SMG brother. The storm isn't awful, but it's like if I asked you, would you rather have a mansion or a mansion with a golf course and a yacht? It's pretty obvious what most people would pick. An interesting fact about the weapon is its ammo regeneration. As players get kills with the Savager, the undead will produce ammunition for the storm, and getting kills with the storm will produce ammunition for the Savager's spinning scythe attack. A really cool way to keep players using both firing modes. But if you find a really good camping spot, the first hour and a half basically looks like this. Riveting! Then there's the arcade, outfitted with three different arcade machines to try. There's the Pinball der Eisendrock machine that teleports players above the map and has them fill up an Outbreak Dragon to receive a reward. Funnily enough, in Outbreak, the dragon uses the same portal effect above the map to escape into the Dark Aether. So instead of having those two effects overlap on each other, they just remove the model. Enduro puts players in control of an RC car to platform, speed boost, and race across a small arena to net points. And finally, Nocturne Toten puts players in, well, Nocturne Toten. With limited ammunition and a timer against them, players must find a way to eliminate the undead with speed, accuracy, and a little bit of luck. Completing three waves within the time limit will grant players a ton of free salvage and a cool nod to the building actually being placed inside the facility. You know, I wonder if this was a plot thread that never got used in the final product. Eh, whatever, it's a cool easter egg regardless. Players can play these arcade games by collecting arcade coins dropped by the undead. They're all really cool additions to the main gameplay. Okay, besides Enduro. Like, come on, just get up there! Players can also purchase arcade tokens, and as a cool little side easter egg, you can also melee the machine for a free one. Arcade tokens also never despawn. So pick up a coin and get some use out of it. Some other cool oddities are the command tower. Something you'll quickly notice is that the undead are unable to spawn in the room, giving players a nice breather from the gameplay. But stay in there too long and you'll be irradiated, forcing you to eventually evacuate the location, even though the time it takes is considerably generous. What's weird is that we know the undead can survive in radiation. Heck, enemies like Megatons are just radiated infused zombies. But you know what, what do I know? Then also there's the Ronald Raygun pizza delivery easter egg. Becoming a pizza boy and running around the map, players are rewarded with salvage, points, and even the possibility of a coveted ray gun. Yeah, uh -huh, a coveted ray gun. I said a coveted- yeah, you know what, this thing just never gave me a ray gun, okay? Just take my word for it. <laughs> Guess what? You can also just inevitably murder him when you don't get it. And finally, there's the added enemies. Just like Firebase Z and Mauro de Toten, the enemy roster continues to expand as the map's rounds go on. On round 8, Tormentors begin to show up. Around round 12, there's Plague Hounds. By round 15, Bargwas make a round-based appearance again. On round 20, Disciples show up once more. On round 25, we get the fifth introduction to the Mangler. Seriously, why is this guy put on every map? 
And finally, on round 30, the Tempest makes its round-based appearance. And just like the Avogadro, yeah, I still hate this guy. And as much as I adore the idea of this ever-growing army, it follows a similar trend that affects Outbreak, a ton of ranged enemies, and it's really annoying to deal with them all. I appreciate the variation, but every enemy has some sort of projectile, making these games closer to bullet hells at time. We've got the Abomination, the Tempest, the Mangler, the Margwa, and even to an extent the Disciple. It's one of Forsaken's worst gameplay aspects, and it doesn't help these enemies hardly share a cohesion between one another. You've got two enemies made of crystals, one that adorns military armor, three eldritch deities, and plague hounds are in there too. I think what's a shame is that this decision was intentional. The enemy roster in Cold War feels like a legitimate and varied army. You have your infantry, your pest, your snipers, your heavy artillery, your wild cards, your medics, your commanders, your beast, your generals, your queen, and your king. The Dark Aether is a living, breathing world with its own hierarchy, but not every enemy needs to show up on every map, and Forsaken is where the developers begin to overdo it. I feel like the Bargwa, Disciple, and Abomination would have made for a great pairing on this map, the fantasy enemies to clash with the sci-fi theme. It's like how Revelations feels disjointed, with all these Apothecon threats, and then there's Panzers and Zetsubo spiders thrown in there for effect. They just didn't need to be in there. And finally, before we can talk about the Easter Egg, let's go over the little things that catch my eye in this map. You can see Peck and Kravchenko viewing the player as they enter any town. For how absent Monty and the Shadowman are in Revelations, it's nice to see Visible Antagonist. In the original Easter Egg, you're supposed to activate an arcade machine by using Kilowatt on a zombie. But because of an unfixed glitch, you can also just use a stun grenade for some reason. In the Rollin Ray Gun Pizza Delivery Side Easter Egg, you just can't kill him using the Crystal Axe Savager which is weird, but I guess they just forgot to code it. Also, Bubby from AW Infection Returns. You're telling me, of all things that gets referenced by pure hapstance, the thing from AW to get referenced in return is Bubby of all things. All right, let's get talking about the game's final main quest, as a lot of the map's story is locked behind it. Once players lift the emergency lockdown, they'll be able to interact with a button inside the command tower, where they'll see Omega achieve their goal of freeing Zykov from the Dark Aether, before revealing he is actually the Forsaken, catching both teams off guard as he unleashes the powers of the Dark Aether upon the base and begins his global conquest. You have to believe me. I didn't realize he was the creature. You. If Forsaken is your first time hearing about Zykov, let's do a little bit of set dressing. He is the man sealed inside a Project End Station in the D-Machina intro. Spending 400 years alone in the Dark Aether, Zykov was left to fester and evolve. It was said he consumed the Elder Gods and became the creature he is now. Pretending to be the man who would lead them to the Forsaken, Zykov tricked Omega and Requiem into freeing him. It's honestly a heart-wrenching story. The man who believed he was forgotten about now makes it his goal to destroy the world. But not because he was Forsaken, but because humanity squandered the peace World War II's destructive war was supposed to bring, seeing destruction as the only means to peace. One of the saddest moments players can pick up on is that despite being Zykov, the Forsaken sees that as a past life, no longer worthy of his identity typically speaking of himself in the third person. Throughout the centuries he conquered and evolved, watching his homeland continue to wage conflict after conflict. Each new decade brought a new battleground. Instead of ending war, war seemed never-ending. Despite my manipulation and deception, I was Casimir Zykov. I am what remains of the man forced to fight for his survival against unimaginable horrors for centuries. Humanity had squandered their chance at peace. In his eyes, 
They did not deserve it. They were not worthy. If the Earth insisted upon chaos, then he would instill order. His order. My order. But then he watched from the dark ether as his world grew more divided than ever. Sides became entrenched in new ideals, refusing to bargain or negotiate. The opportunity for world peace wasted. Honestly, I really like this twist. Even though his name is the Forsaken, a lot of players assume that his goals were to take over the world because he was left behind in the Dark Aether. But instead, in an actually good twist, he doesn't just believe that he needs to take over the world because he was forgotten. He believes that humanity was not able to achieve peace. And that's actually a lot more interesting of a goal than, say, something like the Shadow Man or Richtofen, who just wanted global destruction. Entering the field, Samantha Maxis uses her abilities to halt the Forsaken, doing all that she can to buy the group time. Now with the clock against them, Requiem has to devise a plan, or the whole world will become consumed by the Dark Aether. The area most changed by his presence is the Underground Bunker. Now becoming a Dark Aether hellscape, players must scavenge equipment around the map to create an Ethereum Neutralizer to reach Samantha and defeat the all-powerful Menace. Alongside this, three large Ethereum Crystals are placed around the map to be used in the Easter Egg. Personally, I hate the design of the Dark Aether Bunker, going from a nice palette of colors to one being overtaken by the blue haze covering the area. It's not very pretty to look at. It's kind of like the Archon's green filter. One piece of the Neutralizer has to be acquired by using an Abomination to knock it down from the ceiling. Another part can be found by using an RC car and driving into the TV store, using a similar mechanic found in the custom map Nightmare. And the third and final piece can be obtained by charging these fuel cells and collecting the housing unit. This step is a lot of fun. Hundreds of the undead at the ready, and players have to fight to survive. Or use a Crystal Axe and completely break everything. Look at those disciples fly! Once collected, players now have to go around the map and destroy three Dark Aether Crystals by destroying their surrounding orbs. Once defeated, you can collect an Ethereum Pebble that must be catalyzed inside an Abomination. As crazy as it sounds. Once catalyzed and killed, players can collect a third of the energy needed to fuel the Neutralizer. Doing this two more times will complete the step. On a side note, if you don't have the Crystal Axe, don't even bother attempting this step. Most standard weaponry don't have the damage output necessary to quickly destroy the orbs, and the onslaught of the never-ending undead makes it all but possible to even spend a second destroying the orbs. Enemies spawned include Tempest and Disciples. Once you've built the Neutralizer, you're basically done with the egg. Activating the charge sequence gives us one final interaction between Krauchenko and Peck before train go boom. New orders from the director. If we can't kill this thing, we should try to capture it using the containment chamber Omega built. The director will handle it from there. You think I will just let you take what is rightfully mine? The Forsaken is destined to bring about Soviet supremacy, ending your capitalist reign. What's going on? What are you doing? Colonel, they're breaking through! You idiot! Watch where you're shooting! The gas line! And thus ended the tale of Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Escorting the device, players must quickly collect charged Ethereum crystals to keep the machine going, as it quickly drains any energy fed into it. Fun fact, you can accidentally softlock yourself if you don't collect enough crystals in the middle portion of the escort. Well, uh, have fun being stuck! That's fixed it. Oh, oh I've got no perks. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see, I don't see anything. There's, there has to be one crystal outside. No way, right? What do we do? Um, maybe we go back and look? I'm gonna use an RC to go and search. Never mind, it just rocks. <laughs> and finally, there's the boss fight. Players have to do three things. Destroy a piece of the Forsaken's crystalline armor, charge Samantha Maxis with the souls of the undead, and fire a destructive beam of energy into an exposed part of the Forsaken's body. Doing this four times will complete the boss fight. Relatively simple, and often criticized for such, 
The fight itself is rather quick, and will take players no more than 5 minutes at the most, with the easter egg speedrun being just shy of sub 13 minutes. But why is the Forsaken such a pushover? What are its attacks? Slamming down on the ground, the Forsaken can summon blue shockwaves that lightly damage players. When one of its arms is destroyed, it can summon red orbs that lightly electrify them. When both arms are destroyed, the Forsaken will summon ice storms that, unlike Voyage, actually slow down players. Alongside that, at the halfway point, the Forsaken will shoot a beam of energy at its mouth that can also be easily avoided. Once the stomach is destroyed, a portal is opened on its chest that increases the rate at which the undead appear. And finally, on the last phase, a Krasny soul that will make a cameo. So yeah, one of the running themes of this fight is simply not doing enough damage. And honestly, it's just kind of underwhelming. It's a fun, quick fight, kinda like the Spider Queen scuffle in Setsubo no Shima's main quest, but for the grand finale, I don't feel like I'm remiss in saying I wanted more. Taking after Legion, the boss's difficulty could have been expanded if Legion had times of invulnerability, and teleporting around the arena. Making the boss stagnant in position makes it much more predictable, and with the final blow dealt, the Forsaken will summon crystals that purposely down the player. Or you can survive if you just spam the Crystal Axe. In one final bid to save everyone, Samantha sacrifices herself by traveling into the Forsaken, and destroying him from the inside out, locking herself into the Dark Aether, the same way Zykov did to ultimately shut down the Particle Accelerator, with the rest of the Forsaken getting consumed by the Sophia-looking containment orb. This is the only way. With the Outbreak Zones finally collapsing, the story is finally complete. As we'll meet again plays in the final cutscene, we get our conclusions. Requiem's work is nearly done, the Outbreak Zones are collapsing, and the Dark Aether has been sealed off, and the world is saved. The director of Requiem, with no opposition left, shuts down his department, and has key figures from Weaver to the Strike Team arrested and locked away, with the real villain showing his colors. And as the game closes out, we finally get to see the perpetrator behind all of this. The one and only Edward Richtofen. Mustacheless, but just as cunning as ever. With the most obvious revelation revealed, the scene shifts to five years later. Still alive, William Peck teases a search for the rockets launched into the Pacific Ocean during Operatia Inversia. With the writers promising the story will actually continue. Unlike this, 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 and this. And considering how many of these games have ended on ambiguous cliffhangers, it's nice to see the developers have some security in the story. So that's the Forsaken's main quest. And for the grand finale of the year, it's absolutely a letdown, and leaves the audience wanting more. It's a shame to see the game falter right at the finish line, but considering the game's difficult development history, it's what they could have done. The map's main quest is relatively short, but a shorter, more concise easter egg is better than a lengthy drawn out one that has players groaning, like Revelations or Shallon Shuffle. The main quest is about building an Ethereum Neutralizer. And yeah, you build an Ethereum Neutralizer, alright? Now that I think about it, the map's main quest is just the main quest from Outbreak's second easter egg, but better and doesn't have Outbreak's log. The interactions between Peck, Kravchenko, and the Requiem crew are a lot of fun, and it's clear the story ends when it should have ended. Zykov is a sympathetic main antagonist. You can agree with his goals to a certain point, and the Forsaken at least lives up to the beast he should be, 
It's a boss fight, that's for certain. Forsaken is sadly a byproduct of these constraints and hurdles the team faced while developing Cold War. To the point where maps start out completely unique and fully built from the ground up, to maps built off of the backs of other projects, in some crazy parallel to the real life outcomes of the USSR. I still quite enjoyed my time with the map, but it starts and ends relatively the same. Play No Man's Land through round 10, spend the next three rounds building the Crystal Axe, and then be invincible until you get bored. And then there's the map's finale. Honestly, it's a really good outro cutscene. We'll Meet Again is a great fit, and for once they actually used good cinematography to match the in-game action. In conclusion, Forsaken is the result of blood, sweat, tears, and corporate mandates. I had a pretty good time with the map, but I can understand if audiences feel underwhelmed. But despite my praises, I believe the map is just a 5 out of 10. A middling score because that's all the map is. While I appreciate the hard work that went behind it, Forsaken is a map that exists to finish the game's narrative, with most of its personality wrapped around the Crystal Axe and the Arcade. But now with the wind in their favor, and the proper seeds planted, I can't wait to see what the team at Treyarch works on next. But before we close out, we still have a few more modes to cover. As you can tell by the title, let's get into some of Cold War's side modes. These descriptions are going to be briefer, and there's a lot of ground to cover, so let's get into the non-story related ones first. In a sequel to the controversial Dead Ops Arcade 2, Dead Ops Arcade 3 is a Black Ops 4, energy-inspired fever dream. Like the standard Dead Ops gameplay, Dead Ops Arcade 3 has players fight through 16 different zones to fight one of the Cosmic Silverbacks clan, and rescue your chicken lover, Vendolina. Yeah, it's that kind of weird. In this high score based mode, players must collect treasures to increase their point multiplier, utilize and upgrade temporary special weapons, abilities, and equipment to decimate the undead horde, and time speed boost and nukes to keep yourself alive in this unending onslaught. New to the mode is the wild. Unlike the arena setup that encompasses 90% of the gameplay, the wild is a puzzle solving labyrinth that has players traveling to the exit portal. But with enough knowledge and luck, Players can fully explore the locale and receive rewards beyond their wildest imagination. Rewards include earning a power of fate much earlier than usually given. Fates are game-long power-ups that give players one of six abilities. An infinite death machine, a permanent speed boost, permanent double score multiplier, a defensive item at the beginning of each round, a permanent chicken that functions like a Cerberus and Mauer, or the ability to earn extra lives quicker and revive teammates and themselves in just half the time. Alongside other smaller buffs, each fate is a permanent game changer, and a coordinated team with an understanding of these abilities is needed to defeat the Mama Back at round 64. Along the way, players will fight a massive variety of enemies. There's Nines Gladiators, Blight Fathers, Brutus, Nova Crawlers, Hellhounds, Spiders, Megatons, a Megaton Blaster and Bomber, Insanity Elementals, Margwas, Fury and Wrath from Nine in the Wild, the Giganese, Werewolves who come with a unique ability to heal, Spectral Hellhounds, the Ghost of Alcatraz, Electric Catalysts that summon Lightning Pillars, and Shadow Boogies, a unique enemy originating from Dead Ops Arcade 2 and the Black Ops 3 campaign. Unlike Cold War's gameplay being overwhelmed by a variety of ranged and powerful enemies, Dead Ops Arcade 3's insanity fits perfectly and players are given more than enough tools to win, conquer, and survive. It's truly an adrenaline rush of a mode, and once you get a good game going, it's an amazing time with friends. Unlike the much more oppressive Dead Ops Arcade 1 and 2, which are notorious for their extreme difficulty. And honestly, one of the coolest aspects of this mode is the preservation and utilization of all the hard work that went into many of Black Ops 4's unique enemies. Despite the failures of Black Ops 4, the enemy variety from the Chaos storyline was nothing short of amazing, and it's great to see their spirit carried on. Honestly, I'd highly recommend just taking the time to explore the wild, and see how many little nods and easter eggs you can find. For example, the launchers that spit out fireballs at players are actually just the Viper and Dragon specialist model. And then there's the Mama Back boss fight, which is legitimately hard and can destroy an entire run in as little as 5 minutes. One of the drawbacks of this mode is its length. 
because it's actually possible to consistently make it to the higher levels, an experienced crew should expect a game to last anywhere between 3 and 4 hours. But if you're looking for a more traditional arcade experience, then Dead Ops Arcade 3 does not disappoint. Easily one of the best side modes in the series. Cranked is a fast-paced, saw-like minigame that has players murdering undead as quickly as possible. Keep the game going by killing the undead. As the timer ticks down, players get closer and closer to certain death. With all mystery boxes active, players are continually incentivized to pull score streaks and keep the momentum alive. Fail to kill the undead in time, and well, train go boom. And finally, in our non-story related modes, there's Outbreak Survival. Hey guys, just played Outbreak Survival for the review. And let's go over this awful little side mode as my initial thoughts were a guesstimation of what I assumed the mode played like, as I had no desire to play the mode before being tasked with actually playing a bit of it to record for the review. But after playing it, I learned how obnoxious the mode actually is. So let's talk about it. Players start Outbreak Survival with a limited HUD reminiscent of games previous, a 1911 red starter pistol, the ability to apply custom loadouts is removed, and the ability to regenerate health is also disabled with the only way to recover health is by eating various food items that the undead drop, and produced by scavenging the land. What sounds like a neat little challenge on paper turns into an absolute snooze fest. Outbreak's inherent DNA is reliant on players being able to check the map and travel to the various side objectives, as simply rushing the main objective leads to players being unprepared and kitted out as they traverse to the next world. But in Outbreak's survival, the map is disabled, with only the main objective and beacon being marked to players. Because of this, players have to traverse the play space in search of these side objectives, which sounds like a fun idea that encourages exploration. But honestly, the developers forgot to account for one thing. Outbreak is so boring! If you want to get properly kitted out, it's highly encouraged you participate in said side objectives. But without the map, you have no idea where to go because these areas are so massive. So your gameplay just ends up looking like this. Unless you know the locations of every map side objective, you're going to have to take the time to explore the landscape and hope you stumble upon one of them. So Outbreak is now even more of a slog than it already is, and because there's no inherent health regeneration, you're just going to have to play it extremely safe. Which is boring. Or you'll die because being reckless is way more fun in a game full of ranged enemies. Trust me, you're going to hate the Hellhounds by the end of this experience. And then there's the weapons variety. Not variety, I should say, but more like issues that come from the weapon system. A feature I forgot to specifically bring up is the attachment system. As players level up weapons in Cold War, they'll be able to unlock over 50 different attachments for each weapon as the game shares a progression system with multiplayer. Initially, the game always gave players a random set of attachments as they purchased weapons. And because there are over 50 different attachments, with many of them being balanced around the game's multiplayer, there's a ton of reticles, suppressors, and magazines that hinder players more than they aid them. So throughout the year, a feature was added that allowed players to give each weapon a customized attachment loadout. So if players pick up a weapon in the game that wasn't their starting weapon, and it comes with undesirable attachments, players are able to go into the custom loadout menu and give the gun the attachments that they desire. And in a game as combat heavy as Cold War, optimization goes a long way. But in Outbreak Survival, this feature is disabled, so your guns are not only not optimized, they also suck because you aren't able to actively hunt down the side objectives and properly upgrade yourself and participate in the game's heavy and very steep progression system, which is so reliant on getting set up as early as possible and maintaining that setup, lest you end up being unprepared so quickly. And besides that, the rest of the mode plays the same. Find the objectives, complete them, earn points, salvage, scavenge, whatever. It's an extremely flawed side mode that needed to be reworked in its entirety, but if you're looking for that extra challenge, then it might just be for you. Because it definitely isn't for me. Onslaught, a game mode that takes place at the beginning of the storyline. This game mode pits the strike team on their first mission to contain the outbreaks that have started popping up all around the world. Onslaught has players following an ethereal orb, and feeding it kills every time it stops. After two waves, players fight an elite enemy, which can drop various rewards, including a random perk, score streaks, various weapons, and in the higher rounds, higher tiers of armor, aether tools, and pack-a-punch chalices. After
after defeating the elite enemy, which after a certain update also includes special enemies, but they never re-recorded or changed any lines of dialogue to rectify this change, players rinse and repeat this process until the end of the game. One of my biggest complaints about Onslaught is the moving of the orb. Like Outbreak, following the orb offers no sense of progression or gameplay. It's simply there to do one thing. Take up your time. There's no enemies to fight, no side objectives to complete, and there's really nothing to do besides avoid being in the phase. It's one of my biggest criticisms with the mode, besides it being lackluster overall, as Onslaught takes the base template of multiplayer maps and throws an ethereal orb and the undead into the fray. Honestly, the mode's just not as fun as the developers intended. So let's talk about the modes that remedy nearly all of these points. Onslaught Containment is the correct way this mode should have gone. Taking the multiplayer gunfight maps, Onslaught Containment has a stagnant ethereal orb that commands players to do one thing, fill the soul box. No running around, and no meandering, the mode gets straight to the point. And because of this brevity, Onslaught Containment is the way I'd recommend players experience this mode. Getting into the high rounds is a lot of fun, and the mode actually accomplishes what it originally set out to do, have fast-paced, high-energy Cold War gameplay. And because there were other limited time modes that COULD come back, as many of them do cycle in and out of rotation, let's just bring them up. Onslaught Elite spawns in an Elite every wave. Onslaught Accelerated doesn't even have a description on the wiki, but the mode speeds up the basic Onslaught gameplay, with the Ethereal Orb in constant motion. Onslaught Mystery Mutations gives players a different weapon every wave. Holiday Onslaught sees each map with a Christmas makeover, and usable snowballs that players can use to defeat the undead with holiday cheer. And finally, there's Onslaught Diminishing Light. As players fight the undead, the protective circle around the ethereal orb will begin to shrink, forcing players to think fast and be efficient. And that's Onslaught. Besides Onslaught Containment, the mode is a sloppy, rushed mess that simply exists to give PlayStation some kind of exclusive content for the first year of Cold War's launch. And honestly, we weren't missing out on much. And if you're gonna play Onslaught, just play Onslaught Containment. You know, I wonder how many times I said the word Onslaught in this section about the game mode Onslaught. And finally, there's Outbreak Collapse. The reason I bring this game mode up, all the way at the end of our review, is because the game mode takes place during the events of Forsaken. Following the eventual release and destruction of the Forsaken, Outbreak Zones in various regions become unstable, catching the strike team in the area off guard, and causing an accelerated growth of the zone. Outbreak Collapse features three temporary beacons that players can use to upgrade their equipment. As the world's difficulty gets stronger, Players will receive milestone bonuses that include a major bonus of points and salvage. After surviving 10 minutes, players have the ability to exfil and complete the mission. Honestly, Outbreak Collapse is about as clunky as it seems. Because of the game mode's open world style, it still feels like players have to seek out the undead more than they should, with the game mode not feeling as energetic as the developers had hoped it would be. And my problems with the exfil system still continue to exist. And that's all the side modes that belong to Call of Duty Zombies Cold War, besides the limited time mode Jingle Hells, which as far as I'm aware, has yet to ever return. The team experimented with a bunch of different ideas and concepts, to varying degrees of success. And as much as I appreciate the attempts to branch out and try different things, I would have appreciated it if more of that time and resources went into the main game. But if I'm being honest with myself, ideas like this are the reason zombies exist in the first place so I can't blame the team for always trying something new. And before we end things out, the game has a few more tricks left up its sleeve. It is done. Here, a reward for your offering. Okay, this review is going on way longer than I thought it would, so I'll be brief. In the most recent entry in super easter eggs that can't live up to IW's cheat mode, and arguably a really cool boss fight, Cold War Zombies features its own super easter egg, following the destruction of Project End Station, saving Samantha Maxis, preventing the inversion of the US, failing to rendezvous with Omega Defectors, defeating Valentina, and stopping the Forsaken, players are able to make a return to Outbreak Zoo of all places, and make a pact with an unknown Dark Aether entity. Depending on the amount of quests completed, the player's base weapon rarity, when starting a match, will upgrade between green, blue, 
and purple at the max level. Players will also receive 12 different player emblems based off the game's many characters, a few calling cards, and a wristwatch. Great. For what it's worth, the weapon upgrade is more of a game changer than most people realize. Actually being able to perform high damage in the early rounds of Outbreak and keep a weapon's damage consistent into the later rounds is a massive improvement. And like the RK5 Super Easter Egg from Black Ops 3, you don't need to completely destroy the game's balance in service of a reward. Little rewards like this are a great way to keep players coming back. And if I'm being honest, besides Operatia and Versia, these main quests aren't exactly that difficult either, so it's not like the reward should be super bombastic. And that's all the rewards that players can achieve in Call of Duty Cold War. Besides the already stated stuff like the player upgrade system. We will be watching. And before we close out, let's talk about those things that I only remembered while editing the video. The list is short and sporadic, but Cold War wouldn't be the same without them. A really cool mobility feature reintroduced in Outbreak were the grapple guns. Coming from Black Ops 4's Blackout Battle Royale mode, grapple guns allow players to reach new heights around the Outbreak playspace. While limited by distance, any additional movement goes a long way, and makes it all the better to maneuver around. Coming from glass bottles to soda cans, each of the perks in Cold War was branded with nutritional facts column, like traditional soda cans. Alongside the calorie count, there's an added ingredient list that makes reference to many different quotes throughout the series, as pointed out by my friend Parker. Oh, that tasted like liquid shock! And also, there's just a ton of cute easter eggs, like the calorie count for death perception being 2020. I'd highly recommend checking out all the different labels. And honestly, I just forgot to go into how much personality oozes from each of these machines in contrast to the well-designed, but albeit lackluster chaos statues, and the time period appropriate Wonderfist dispensers. You can also pet Plaguehounds and Hellhounds when they are turned. Such a cute feature! Only on D-Machina, the Wonderfist will take approximately 15 rounds to spawn into the map once the pack of bunches is activated. It's a somewhat cool feature, as it gives players a late game bonus, but unless players are consistently traveling into the Dark Aether, some of the machine's exclusive perks like Tombstone, Mule Kick, Death Perception, and PhD are locked into a later round. But it's not like these perks are needed at all times, nor are they imperative to the early game setup. What's also really cool is that each of these perks comes with a Dark Aether inspired jingle, when these machines are listened to in the Dark Aether. Well, if I missed anything, leave it in the comment section below. So let's finish this review out already. From humble beginnings as an underfunded yet passionate side project, to a multi-million dollar investment, back to an underfunded yet passionate side project, Cold War Zombies is everything the developers set out to do, and even a little bit more. The game features both nuanced and simplistic storytelling for different types of players, and actually features a traditional narrative with a clear beginning, middle, and end. Featuring some fun twists, and turns, and good direction in terms of camera work and storyboarding, the game's new cast of characters are lively, although should be playable. It sounds simple, but for a series like Zombies, this all goes a long way. The gameplay is some of the most fun and well thought out. It's creative, fast paced, and completely player oriented, with a return to progression as the game's primary focus. Many of Black Ops 4's more intricate systems make a return in unique ways, and features like the Rampage Inducer give players more ways to play. Outbreak is the next first big step for the series, and whenever Treyarch fails to find success in something, you know they'll always return to the drawing board and master it the second time. Or maybe they'll completely mess it up. It's always up in the air with these guys. But for all the praises I've sung, one of Cold War's biggest flaws that I've yet to bring up is an issue I can describe with one statement. You've played it once, you've played it all. Which I feel describes the game perfectly. A number of issues create this statement. A bigger focus on capturing a casual audience, a lack of resources to create the grandiose vision this series is known for, 
and the development time being split between the ending of Black Ops 4, this title, and then the future release of Vanguard Zombies. It's quite obvious Cold War shouldn't have stood a chance even from day one, but I truly believe the team at Treyarch did everything they could, and I think the game is amazing. At least when I'm actually playing it. Unlike other COD titles, Cold War is a difficult game to come back to because I've already done everything that there basically is to do in it the first few times I play a map. I wouldn't say that there's a lack of content, just a lack of unique ways to play said content. But if you love Cold War, then that's great. Despite some of its more lackluster experiences, I can't recommend this game enough, as it's the safest entry in the series. You'll know what you're getting into, and because the DLC is free, you're basically getting the best bang for your buck out of the entire game mode, next to Black Ops 3 with Zombie Chronicles. Many of these entries play it safe. And unlike other games, Cold War doesn't run the risk of having players adore one map and hating the rest. Cold War is an extremely solid game. And considering the uncertainness of the series when this game was released, this was the smartest decision that the team could have made. If you were unsatisfied with your experience, it's completely understandable. So here's to more zombies goodness. And here's to the future. Who knows what these developers will do next. Maybe another Trango Boom. As these projects expand more and more, my love for the series grows alongside with it. I hope my perspective on the game inspires you to play it again, or maybe even pick it up for the first time. Whatever the case may be, as long as you're playing Zombies, then my work here is done. Thanks to Junior Rizzo for collaborating and cameoing. You should check him out! And thanks to LastGen for making the amazing thumbnail render for this video. If you liked what you saw, I couldn't recommend enough my other reviews of Infinite Warfare's IW Zombies, Sledgehammer's World War II Zombies, Raven's Advanced Warfare Zombies, and the first part of a Black Ops 4 review series with Treyarch's 9. Thank you all for watching, and whatever comes next, always remember, keep on slaying.